Hi, everyone. Welcome to Code for Lib. Uh, I, I have the sudden crushing weight of realizing I'm like now the face of Code for Lib because I have the opening MC slot, but uh, I'll get over it. Um, so, welcome to San Jose. How are newcomer dinners? Good? Yeah? 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 Okay, cool. Um, so, it is now time for Code for Lib to happen. Um, I don't have inspirational words for you, uh, but it'll be fine. Uh, so, we have many announcements. Uh, thank you very, very much to Clear DLF for continuing to be our fiscal host, uh, especially uh, Bethy, uh, Bethany Nowitzki and her thoughtful counsel over the past year, even though I, yeah, so that's awesome. Um, and congratulations to her new post, to her on her new post as Dean of Libraries at James Madison. So, thank you, Be Bethany. All right, and a big thanks to uh, Jen and Kathy at Concentra. This is their fifth year with the conference, um, and they've done a great job supporting us, helping the conference grow and mature and, and all that. Um, so we really, I don't think we'd be where we are today without them, so thank you. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge that this meeting is taking place on native lands. This is the lands of the Tamian Ohlone, so. Um, there is Wi-Fi, if you have not found it yet. The Wi-Fi network is called Code for Lib, so if you have not found it yet, I don't know what to tell you. Um, the password is Code for Lib. Um, if, you, if there's any ambiguity about it, that's lowercase c-o-d-e, the number four, lowercase l-i-b. Um, please be kind to the Wi-Fi. Uh, don't stream the conference from the conference. Uh, you'll break the internet. Um, Keep multiple devices connected to a minimum. Don't start up any uh, Warcraft servers, uh, but things like that. No, no torrent nodes. Um, let's see. There are mic runners out there um, who will be running mics for people with questions. Uh, presenters can get a Lavalier mic if you find a nice person from conference services and, 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 and ask. We also have these, which seem to mostly work pretty well. Um, things about mic usage, the mic should be pointing at your mouth and your mouth should be pointing at the mic. If you have a handheld mic, it is, think of it like a piece of food, so you want it like near your mouth, like you're gonna eat it. Um, and it's a, a candy bar, not an ice cream cone. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, also, the mic is extra important because transcription services is relying on the audio feed to do the transcript. Uh, okay, if it is not already the case, in a few short moments or a few slightly longer moments, there will be sign-ups for uh, breakout sessions and the first lightning talk sessions this afternoon in the lobby, I believe, by the registration desk. Um, so don't all make a mad rush just yet. Um, save it for break, but they're out there. So people who are wandering in might take advantage of it, who knows. Okay, duty officers are no longer called duty officers. We have uh, given them the, the kinder and gentler name community support volunteers. They still have the same duties. Um, so if you see references to community support volunteers or CSVs, which I promise is not a pun of any sort, uh, it's the same uh, responsibilities that were once assigned to duty officers and in fact it's the same group of people so just make that mental switch. Today the community support volunteers for the morning are Wayne Graham and Francis Kaiwa. Um, they're located in the back somewhere. You guys, there's Francis and there's Wayne. All right, thank you. They're, they're in the middle row in the very back corner seats there. I believe those seats are saved for duty officers so you should always be able to find your duty officers there. Uh, and if that's not the case, it is now because I just said it. Um, lanyards, so we've got a lanyard system here at Code for Lib. If your lanyard is green, it is okay to photograph that person without seeking permission. Um, if their lanyard is yellow, please ask before photographing, and if they say no, then don't photograph them. And if the lanyard is red, do not even bother asking, do not photograph, uh, please just be respectful of, uh, of those choices. Um, if you see someone with a black and white striped uh, lanyard, they are a community support volunteer. Um, I'm not sure how community support volunteers indicate their preference about photographs then. But, uh, oh, I think some people are doubling up lanyards. So there we go. Yeah. 
All right. Um, <clears throat> oh, I have a five minute intro to the conference that I'm supposed to give at this point, uh, which means that AV folks, we need the uh, monitor to switch to the slides. Which I'll just wait by looking at this thing until I see my, hey, there we go. Okay, uh, so these, these are uh, introductory slides that have been passed down um, from a couple folks. I inherited it from Becky, who inherited it from a person called Cummerbund. They were not the real Dread Pirate Roberts either. Um, okay, so many of you may be new to Code for Lib, or this is relatively early in your Code for Lib career. Um, you should feel, we want you to feel welcome and be able to have fun. So here's some advice. Um, you might be asking this question, why, how did I end up in this place, right? Um, you know what, I'm gonna change this so that I'm looking at my notes because I can't do this without the notes. I should have thought ahead. I forgot that I had slides to do. Um, so excuse me while I do this. Oh, hey, thank you, AV people. Uh, do, 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 extend. And then I'm going to do the thing with Google Slides that I have to do, keep changes. Google Slides is only slightly annoying when it comes to presenter mode. Drag this over to the other monitor. No, where is the other monitor? Which direction is it in? I don't know. Can I have the, um, the, the can we switch the thing for, the, for a moment? Uh, the AV switch to the second monitor. All right, I need to figure out, there it is. Okay, uh, 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 okay. and why is this not, why are there no slides there? Wow, I am certainly burning through the time. Let me, I know, I will re reload. Reload, oh, that didn't work. All right, this is what we're gonna do. Sorry, everyone. Oh, great, I broke the internet. All right, I'll do this without slides then, if you insist. Ugh. Ugh. Drag it back over. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. <laughs> Ugh. Okay. How about, this? yes, we are fail for living in action right now. <laughs> this is awesome. Um, All right, any second now, any second now. Hey, there we go. Present, presenter view. Take this, put it over here. Okay, uh, AV, I think we're in good shape now. And come over here, hit F12. No, not F12, F11. God bless America. It's like I've done this before. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, you need to hit function, okay. Function, F11. Hey, <laughs> woo, all right. This is great. Okay, so you might not think of yourself as a coder or a coding person in libraries, um, and you're not really sure how you ended up here and why you're here and what your purpose in Code for Lib Universe is, and that's okay. Um, there, there are lots of different types of people here, and we don't all work directly with code, and we don't all work directly with libraries. Um, most of us are coming here with a diverse set of skills and interests, at, but we, we, we come together at some sort of intersection of libraries and museums and archives and technologies related to those things. Code for Lib's not an official organization of any sort. It's more like a collective. There is no governing body for Code for Lib, and that's, that's super interesting. I think one of the things that makes it effective. Uh, things get done by people deciding that things should get done and taking initiative. Um, we also uh, like to share, and one of the ways that uh, uh, one of the way that people share cool stuff that they do is by showing it at a conference like this one. Um, so there's lots of information that's going to get thrown at you in a short time. You will be mentally exhausted. Uh, take a break. Practice good self-care. Um, if you need to leave the conference room at some point to just be away from the sound, that is, that is good. Feel free to do it. Um, 
There will be things that, uh, there is a quiet room, by the way. I'm not sure where it is, uh, but if you need the quiet room, it's available. Um, if you need to take a nap for lib, you should do that. That's my favorite breakout activity. Um, there will be information that goes over your head. There will be technologies you've never heard of. Uh, that's normal. Um, this, this could be the majority of the things you see. It happens, uh, encountering new stuff at Code for Lib, it happens to everyone. No one's an expert at everything. Uh, so don't worry if not everything, every single thing you mentioned is familiar to you. Um, so there's going to be the presentations on these screens and on this stage, and there's also the back channels. If you do not yet know about the back channels, the key ones to look, out, look at are Twitter. Lots of stuff goes out over Twitter about the conferences that's happening. The official hashtag is hashtag C4L19. Um, there's an IRC channel, uh, pound, because it's, not a, it's not, a, not a tweet, pound, code for lib. Um, and then there's a Slack channel, and there's this uh, Google invite uh, that you can use to get uh, to join the Slack channel. Um, lots of stuff happens during the conference on the back channel, um, so it's good to keep an eye on it, contribute to the conversations there, um, but don't get so sucked into the back channel that you miss what's going on up here because it's, it's, it, is a, it could divide your attention. Um, but it is an essential part of the conference experience. All right. So other things to know, um, you'll see lots of talk about beer because lots of, lots of people at Code for Lib like craft beer. Um, if you don't like craft beer, there are other things to do, so don't, don't feel uh, uh, sad if you're not a beer person. Um, some things you'll see are things like uh, the double minus signs and the double plus signs, and this is, a, this is a programming joke. What we'll do is we'll say something like such and such plus plus if we like it, or we'll say such and such minus minus if we don't like it, um, and uh, feel free to engage in such activity. There's also the code for lib versus code for lib debate. There is a right answer. I'm not going to tell you which one it is. Don't make me come over there. All right. Um, the great thing about the conference is there's a diverse range of interests. There's lots of gamers, crappier drinkers, musicians, joggers, people who get up at absurdly early hours to work out, people who like to bake, uh, lots of other stuff going on. There's a social activities page on the wiki, and there's like a Google Doc of self-directed activities uh, for you to engage in. Um, so, and there's a game night on Wednesday, there's karaoke on Wednesday, there's, some, there's a reception tonight, so cool. Um, you will find things that are fun for you regardless of what you count as fun. Um, food is important to us, we like food. Um, there's lots of food at the conference. There's breaks, there usually be snacks, um, and always coffee. Coffee is extra important. Um, but since we engage with food so much, try to move yourself around, engage, like, like find different opportunities to food with people because food is one of our main community activities. Um, and uh, in the worst case, you can, you can um, like hang out at the buffet table at the reception and just interview everyone who comes past. Uh, last reminder, the website and the wiki are great resources for updated conference information and social events. Keep an eye on those pages, the social events wiki, if you're looking to do other things with people. And that is the welcome spiel, which took considerably longer than it should have. So, thank you. All right, now let me fix the AV mess that I have made. I think I can close this now. And this, all right, and back to my notes, which are not done, my apologies. Okay, so we're almost ready. Oh, I'm not even that off time. The, so uh, I will give our introduction to our opening speaker in a moment. The one last thing to say is I believe there's one set of slides that we're lacking, and that's Scott W. H. Young and Jason A. Clark. Where are you folks? We need your slides. Um, please put them on the computer during the break. All right, let me introduce our keynote speaker. Our keynote, Sarah Roberts. Sarah Roberts is Assistant Professor of Information Studies at the uh, Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. She is internationally recognized as a leading scholar on the emerging topic of commercial content moderation of social media. Her book on the topic, Behind the Screen, Content Moderation in the Shadows of Social Media, is forthcoming in 2019 from Yale University Press. Professor Roberts is 2018 Carnegie Fellow and a 2018 winner of the EFF Pioneer Award. And with that, I will introduce uh, Sarah Roberts. 
much. Also, more AV wrangling. All right. Thank you. Awesome. I think we're, we're, we're ready to go. All right, hot mic. Check, yeah? Good morning, everyone. Hey, I'm really excited to be here, and I'm not just saying that. Um, you know, you may have been expecting Safiya Noble. She couldn't make it. Uh, she is a, a good, close friend, and uh, I often have the, uh, the, the dubious uh, honor of following in her footsteps at events. This time I'm replacing her. It doesn't get much harder than that, so I'm going to do my best um, to, uh, to, to bring something to you today that I hope will energize you uh, in her stead. Um, truly, I couldn't be more pleased to be here. I've always wanted to attend this conference. I've known about this organization since really close to its inception when uh, one of the, the people who was involved in the, in the organizing of it told me about this new collective that was going to put together this journal on these issues, broadly speaking, of tech and librarianship, and I thought that that was amazing and cool and needed. Um, so I guess this is quite a way to come to my first conference. Um, I'm grateful, so thank you for asking me uh, to be here. I mean, there is a session at this conference called Blockchain is Snake Oil. I don't know, this is where I wanna be. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty fantastic. So, um, uh, in, the, in the limited time I have today and in the too many slides I have, I'm going to share with you, you know, really what I think is the, uh, the culmination of my own academic research, which it comes out of my orientation uh, as a person in the world of librarianship and information studies. Uh, and comes out of also years as, a, as an information professional and a, a, what we might also just call a tech worker, which is the way I often refer to myself. Uh, I'm going to kick it off with, you know, kind of a, kind of a cheap shot, because why not? We need, we need something to coalesce around today. Um, anybody see this when this came out last <laughs> year? I've got some nods. I've got some head shaking. I've got some hissing. That's all the appropriate. Uh, responses. Um, we're going to come back to this, uh, but we're just going to kind of we're going to we're going to frame it frame it up with this this hot take um, from Forbes uh, last year, kind of around this time. I, I mean, it's a little dated, but I feel like I could go find the exact same thing right now on the internet if I wanted to. Um, I don't want to. This one is fine. Um, Keep that in mind, we're gonna come back to it. Uh, but today, uh, as, as you heard, I'm here to talk to you about uh, what I refer to as commercial content moderation. And in the past, when I've talked about this, and I've been doing this um, work now for about almost nine years, thinking and, and, and talking about this topic in various ways, I had to do a lot of stage setting about what is content moderation. Okay, I'm feeling like this crowd, I might be able to scaffold up and over that a little bit. Because here's how I used to start it out. You know when you take your phone and you like take a picture and you upload it to the internet and you share that out with your friends and people would be like, yeah, and I'd be like, well, you know there are people in between that process and you disseminating that to the world who might make decisions about whether or not your content should stand or should be removed from that platform. That's a true thing. Did you guys know this? Yeah, of course, you guys know this, because you know about information intermediaries, and you know that there's invisible information work going on all, all over the place, especially when it comes to the tech side of the house. But when I first started thinking about this and talking about this with people, they said, no, there's not. Or they said, in some cases, you are a liar. Uh, you're lying. The social media platforms would never do that to us. Information wants to be free. Okay, we'll keep that one in mind, too. But here we are now. 
here we are today. Here we are 2019. Uh, it's no longer um, a contested issue whether or not there are workers who actually do this kind of work. Um, in fact, through a series of unfortunate missteps, really bad gaffes, embarrassing PR uh, situations, all the way to kind of like horrific, disturbing, illegal, um, uh, violent kinds of uh, material being circulated online, in response, major social media platforms have really come out about this legion of workers that they have around the world as serving as gatekeepers uh, to curtail that kind of material being circulated. Uh, and it's really been in the last two years that they've not only been out about this fact, but they're really touting this workforce in a lot of ways as a solution to the kinds of problems that they are having and the uh, pressures that they're encountering from a variety of sectors. Uh, that's really a sea change. That is a sea change from where we were even just a couple years ago when uh, you tried to get the major social media firms and tech companies on record about whether or not they, uh, they uh, had these practices and whether or not they had this kind of staff. Uh, in 2013, a Microsoft um, kind of PR uh, uh, spokesperson said to NPR that it was a quote unquote yucky job and then left it at that. Uh, so this is really kind of a, a new time and uh, it, it's, it's timely for us, I think, to be talking and thinking about the role of people who work um, to both provision and also uh, withhold information uh, at this particular political moment. But I want to take you back to where this all began for me, which was in 2010 in the middle of a cornfield. And that cornfield was Champaign-Urbana. Do we have any Illinois grads here? Oh, I knew we would. Yeah, thank you. Very proud grads up front. Thank you very much. Um, I was uh, attending the U of I doing my PhD in information science after um, having done my master's degree at Madison. This is shameless. Any Badgers in the house? Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. I kind of more identify with the Badgers, but it's fine. Anyway, I was in the middle of this, I was in the middle of this cornfield. Uh, you know, if you know Champaign, it is, it is a university town surrounded all over by, by agriculture. Uh, that, is, that is the economy of that part of the state. Uh, and I was there um, teaching in the MLIS program in the summer and, and taking my own courses. I was on a break and reading the New York Times and there was this little tiny article, you know, what we would call below the fold if we think about papers as analog objects anymore, below the fold kind of um, article in the text section about workers who were working in rural Iowa just a couple hours to the northwest of where I was sitting at that moment and they were working in what seemed to be a call center environment. And in that call center environment, they weren't answering service calls or uh, helping people with, with issues that they were having. They were actually adjudicating social media content that was being uh, uh, streamed into this call center and that they were being asked uh, to, uh, to evaluate, essentially. Uh, at this time, in, in 2010, I'd already been on the internet for a couple decades. Uh, I knew something, I thought, about the nature of the internet. I knew something about the nature of tech. I knew something about the kind of labor that went into all that work. And frankly, I was doing a PhD on all that stuff. And yet, at that point, I'm not ashamed to admit, I had never stopped to consider, A, that this workforce might exist, and B, who they might be, C, where they were in the world, D, what they were called on to do and who was calling the shots, none of it. It blew my mind, quite frankly. Uh, I immediately looked up this company that was listed among others in uh, the New York Times article at the time. It was called Calaris. They've changed their name a number of times. Let me tell you, when you're a PhD student searching for a dissertation topic, this is gold when you go to a website and they have as their tagline, outsource to Iowa, not India. Um, boom, mic drop. What were they trying to say with that? Well, I think, I think it's pretty clear. I think they were selling the companies they were soliciting on something called Midwest values. I think they were selling them on an ideal of a certain kind of person that we would perceive lived in rural Iowa, probably looked a lot like my family members, kind of corn-fed Midwestern white people, maybe worked on farms a couple generations ago. If you know anything about anybody from Iowa out here? 
Yeah, all right. So, okay, we got a lot of Midwest stuff going on right now. Um, those of you from Iowa know that this bucolic scene of the uh, family farmstead is something <laughs> of a relic. Uh, in fact, where Calaris is located in Iowa is farm aid country. You know, Willie Nelson had a, had a concert there in the 80s to try to save family farms. People got booted off their farms, foreclosures happened, and it's now corporate agribusiness for the most part in that area, which leads us to why these folks are working in call centers. When they were interviewed uh, for the New York Times, a couple of them remarked, well, I, I was doing shelving at Walmart before this, and this seems better. Uh, I'm working in the tech industry uh, now, and that, that's a leg up. So I, you know, I, like I said, I was blown away by finding out about this group of people in Iowa, just, you know, just a few hours from me by car. And uh, I went around the university talking to the best and brightest folks I knew, including other grad students, but also professors in a variety of domains. And I said to them, did you, did you know about these people? And two a one, they said two things to me. The first thing they said was, huh, I never thought of that. I never thought about that. Just like me, I felt a little bit validated there, right? Um, these folks aren't, weren't dumb. They weren't, they weren't uh, ignorant. They just, they didn't know. Why didn't they know? And the second thing they said to me, and here's, here's where you're going to be in on this one, right? Don't computers do that? Don't computers do that? Don't computers adjudicate that content? Can't computers just figure that out? Can't we throw an algorithm on it? Okay, I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is no. We can't just throw an algorithm on it, okay? We certainly couldn't in 2010. But I wanted to make sure. So I walked over to this place called NCSA. Anybody ever heard of NCSA around here? National Center for Supercomputing Applications? Came up with this little thing called Mosaic. Ever heard of it? Yeah, right, Mosaic, the web browser, Telnet came from there. A lot of stuff comes out of there that you've probably used over the years. So I went over there because I needed to talk to somebody who might have the kind of chops to be employed there. And I went to a, a guy who was a research scientist in a computer vision lab. And he was, uh, you know, working in one of these cubes, one of these darkened um, spaces to, to do visualization and, or to do computer vision work. Uh, which, is, which is the work of trying to get computers to recognize and process uh, objects. And I said, can you tell me something about the state of the art? Because I've come across this problem uh, in the social media industry, and I'm wondering if it's really feasible for computers to just sort of like solve it. And he laughed and he gestured over in the middle of the room where there was like a wooden table set up. And he said, see that? And I said, yeah. He said, well, right now we're working on getting the computer to know that the table is a table in this static black room where they controlled every element of the environment. Nothing was moving. They put the table there. They knew the parameters of the table. They knew its dimensions. All right, think about that kind of a problem put on something like a blurry video that's uploaded from a cell phone from somewhere with no context, and we start to see the problems. Now, have the fields of computer vision and machine learning evolved since 2010? Yes, they have, okay? But the fundamental problem still remains. How do you make computers know and understand and, and uh, sense make out of some of the most complex material that exists. Well, for a long time, you didn't. What you did was you hired people. And this is what the industry's solution was um, to that very problem. So what is commercial content moderation? Well, content moderation itself, I would argue, has been around since the social internet has been around. And the social internet has been around since the internet has been around. Uh, people have been interacting, posting, arguing with each other online uh, as far back as we can remember, as far back as it was possible to, to send and receive messages. And they've also been setting up rules of governance since that time. They've been um, sort of self-organized in that practice in, in large part, but you could go to different groups on Usenet or a different BBS or a different ERC channel, whatever, whatever you wanted to do, and you could have radically different experiences about what was allowed and disallowed. The difference was that those things were typically done um, in a tangible way. Uh, people were often arguing about those things. You could kind of identify who the people were in power to make those decisions to a certain extent. And for the most part, nobody was getting paid to do that, right? Now, if we flash forward to the contemporary moment and the contemporary commercial internet, what we have is um, people who actually are doing that work and they're doing it for pay. And they're doing it primarily as a function of brand management for social media companies. That seems like a nuance in some ways, but it's an important one. 
of course they protect users, of course they uh, try to make the community spaces better and other kinds of rhetoric that we've heard, but fundamentally their job number one is to be responsible to the platforms who are ultimately responsible to their customers who are anyone? Yeah, right here for the win, yes. At, yeah, oh, you're, okay, you're repeating that. Yes, advertisers, that's right. So they're responding to advertising need, right? This is important to understand how this industry came to be. Why does it exist and for whom does it exist fundamentally and ultimately? Uh, so the people who are working in that context are the people that I call uh, commercial content moderation. And that, in fact, is a new phenomenon uh, that has grown up around uh, the scaling, the massive scaling of the social media industry itself. What do I mean by that? Well, here's one example. Anybody seen this stat? User-generated content on YouTube. 400 hours of video per minute, per hour, per day, and on and on. That was a stat that was released in 2015. I'm willing to bet it has increased since that time. So if we think about each platform having its uh, user-generated content channels pretty much wide open for solicitation of content because that's what they need and that's what they thrive on to keep users engaged, uh, you should just do some real quick multiplica multiplication and see the scale of the issue of user-generated content and the gatekeeping that needs to go on uh, in order to contend with it. So what is the work of uh, commercial content moderation? Well, it's, you know, it's seemingly paradoxical in, in some ways. They work on uh, the fundamental rendering of content, visible or invisible, while remaining largely invisible themselves. So you don't see a trace of, an, uh, of a commercial content moderator's work. In fact, the sign of doing a good job in this world is to leave no trace at all. Uh, so it becomes difficult for users and others, other stakeholders that we can talk about later, to perceive of the decisions that are made and their impact when they can't even precisely locate the decisions themselves. In fact, when we just think about it, like how do you account for an absence? How do you know something that someone wanted to be there isn't there? I mean, we have ways of finding that out now, usually like when people raise a stink, for example, that's one good way to find out. But by and large, that is a paradigm that is set up to, to not allow that kind of information to flow. And so that's one reason when we go back to thinking about why nobody felt like they were informed about these legions of workers being in Iowa or anywhere else. Um, it's because of the very nature of the demands of the work and the way it is fit, fitting a need to, uh, to make, uh, to make a, a, a place for itself by, by being absent, essentially. Nevertheless, if you talk to anyone within the industry, they will tell you that this work is considered mission critical. So here again, we have this sort of, this sort of paradoxical relationship of mission critical work uh, that no one in the firms will do without that is completely um, intangible to the average person. And I mentioned that some of the ways that we find out about this work and have found out about it over the years is, is, is due to people raising the issue uh, when they've been negatively impacted. Another way that this has come to the fore is through uh, workers themselves who, who do this job, because I'm here to tell you that this is actually a pretty tough job. Uh, what it asks you to do is to be steeped in the things that most people don't want to see. And it's typically a low paid job, it's typically low status, and in some cases it's even being done on platforms, micro labor platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, Upwork, other uh, kind of gig work style platforms that offer absolutely no accountability or support to workers. Uh, and the work is often done on a piece by piece basis. In 2012, some workers who were doing the work on uh, what was called Odesk at the time uh, leaked to a journalist the conditions under which they were working and they were seeing uh, images of animal abuse, child abuse, violence, gore over and over again. They were disturbed by what they were seeing. Not only were they disturbed by what they were seeing, but they were disturbed by what was being uploaded to the internet in many ways, right? Um, that this, this content seemed to be um, part and parcel of the UGC environment. And uh, when that came out, Facebook uh, released this reporting guide, which you know, I really don't expect you to read. I just put it up there to show kind of the complexity, even in 2012, of what was going on. 
and also the expectation that workers utilize this sort of flowchart logic to respond to um, a piece of content. In essence, when we think about can computers do the work or should they do the work, behaving like an algorithm, um, asking if-then kinds of logic questions and following through uh, to an outcome. And this was their response. But what I found interesting at the time was that it gave some real clarity about the kind of stuff people were seeing. Uh, threats of vandalism, graphic violence, uh, credible threat of violence, illegal drug use, self-harm, suicidal content. I mean, that's not the half of it. That's a little taste, right? Uh, and it also told us something on this, uh, this infographic about where uh, their, the content moderators, in this case for Facebook, were located at the time. And, and at this time, they were um, telling us that they had folks not far from here in Menlo Park. They had people in Austin, Texas, people in Dublin, and people in, in India. Uh, 2012, uh, that may have been the case. I can tell you there's a lot more sites than that now today. So through, uh, through my research, as I started looking into this and, and trying to follow the thread, and, and I'll tell you, it was, it was tough to do because all the workers are under non-disclosure agreements to not speak about their work, to not uh, disclose where they work, for whom they work, or under what conditions. Um, you know, I had to kind of uh, get creative, let's put it that way, about how to uh, find workers and how to convince them to be willing to talk to me. One of the ways I had to do that was to promise anonymity and to give them pseudonyms and to give pseudonyms to their places of work uh, and so on, which is something that I, I still do today. But in so doing, I was able to uh, discover that, in fact, what I was thinking of as sort of like a monolithic situation of one type of, of content moderation work was actually fractured and uh, stratified across a lot of industrial sectors and indeed all over the globe. Here's just a, a, a brief overview of that. We had workers in-house. We had workers working at Menlo Park, for example, as disclosed on that, um, on that chart. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. We had workers working for boutique firms who specialized in social media management, who did things like commercial content moderation for brands or, or other companies who didn't have tech uh, facilities or uh, the skill sets on staff to do it. But they were also doing things like seeding content, writing content. You know, if that Facebook page for a cookie brand kind of had tumbleweeds going through it, they might hop on under some, uh, uh, you know, un, uh, uh, unassuming account name and type something like, boy, aren't these cookies great? They're my favorite. I just love these cookies. Yeah, people were doing that, right? So they were doing both sides of, those, uh, of, of that kind of social media management, weeding and seeding. Um, we, of course, had call center workers. We had call center workers in Iowa. We had them in India. We have people working in the Philippines, which we'll talk about more. We have people in Romania, people all over the world, uh, Barcelona, working in these call center-like environments, these large industrial spaces, kind of cube farms, uh, if you think of it, uh, doing this work. It's a 24 by 7 process, and it necessitates, uh, according to the industry, people being all over the world. And then, as I mentioned, we had the micro-labor websites, the most difficult um, area of the work to know about because of the nature of the work, where people come together with a task or a need and, uh, you know, separate uh, just after that task with no accountability on either side. Many firms were putting together uh, labor from all of those sectors to meet their need when you think about the great need for uh, vis-a-vis -vis the amount of UGC that they were receiving. They couldn't just cover it with people at their HQ, so they had to outsource to these uh, call centers or put tasks up on, a, on Mechanical Turk uh, just to meet the need that they had from uh, user-generated flagging of content. Anybody here ever flagged something? Yeah, you don't have to raise your hand if you're like, I'd rather you not know. But yes, I know a lot of you have, right? You flagged something that you saw that you thought was inappropriate. Where does that go? It goes to queues that people respond to, the people that I'm talking about today. So some of the first workers I talked to um, throughout the course of my research were working at a firm I call Megatech. Um, that is not its real name, but it is a firm located in this area. Uh, it's, uh, so you, you know, take your pick. Um, they were all, the people I talked to from, from Megatech, they were all college grads. They were coming from elite schools. That was actually seemed to be a hiring preference of Megatech. They were coming, though, not from engineering departments, but from those you know, lesser disciplines of history and economics and English. That's a joke. Those are not lesser disciplines. Those are very important. How many of us are from those disciplines? Show of hands if you want. 
Um, right, so they, they weren't making it into that, uh, that hiring pool of the engineering or the product dev or these other kinds of um, uh, employment areas that sort of live in our imagination, I think, when we think about Silicon Valley. Uh, they were also coming with student debt. <laughs> they were coming on the heels of an economic downturn uh, in the US economy, and many of them expressed you know, happiness to just be employed. Uh, they came in, however, uh, not as full-time, full-badge employees at Megatech. They came in as contractors, and they joked with me about this, you know, um, yeah, we have the wrong color badge, which means we can't use the climbing wall and we don't get the free sushi. You know, and they kind of laughed about that. Um, it also meant they didn't get health insurance, which was a bigger deal, okay? And it was a bigger deal, especially in a job uh, that sometimes necessitated seeking health care, mental health care in particular, um, because of the nature of the work. They didn't really have that uh, as, a part of their, uh, as a part of their contract. In fact, these were people who were term limited to a period of two years on this job. They could cycle in for one year, work one year on, on the job, be three months off the contract, and then come back on for one more year at which time the aspirations to kind of get a foot in the door and move up within Megatech came to an end and they found themselves in a revolving door uh, back out on the sidewalk seeking another job at the lower echelons of the tech industry. One of the workers I talked to, Max, I mean, he summed it up like this. Uh, not only was the work low status and low wage, but it was incredibly taxing and he took it home with him. He took it home in his mind. Uh, he said he, can't, he couldn't imagine how anyone could do this work and not have that happen. He would go home and dwell on it. Um, you know, another, uh, another one of his colleagues, Josh, told me, um, despite having it on his mind all the time, he didn't want to talk about it. He was under an NDA, so he couldn't. But even if he wanted to kind of reach out to people in his uh, peer network or uh, to partners and so on, uh, you know, he just felt like he was being separated from those relationships by the nature of the work. He described, in fact, what he did as uh, being in a hole of filth for eight hours a day. Uh, his colleague Max told me of one example where, you know, he, he went back home one night after a shift and Max was someone who often told me, you know, this isn't a job for everyone. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for everyone, but I can do it. I've got it. I'm, you know, I can, uh, I can deal with it, I can take it, and in fact, I, I'm willing to do that so that other people don't have to. Uh, you know, I, I'm strong enough to handle it. And who was I to contradict him? I, I believed him, I took it at face value. And then, sometime later in our conversation, he said, you know, I've been drinking a lot since I started this job. Uh, and one night, I was sitting on the couch with my partner and she came near me and kind of was, goofing around and trying to get intimate and we got into a moment of intimacy and suddenly an image flashed before my eyes of something I'd seen at work that day and I shoved her away. He just put up his hands and pushed her away and he said and he didn't even know how to tell her what he'd seen and more to the point he didn't want to. So eight hours a day wasn't really the boundary for these workers. Uh, it was very difficult for them to put up a boundary. And how do you do that? How do you put those boundaries up in your mind? And what does it mean when you start to compartmentalize your life in those ways anyway? I, I'm no therapist, I'm no psychoanalyst, but I think folks might uh, suggest that that's not even a healthy behavior particularly. Why were they doing this work? Well, again, it was, uh, it, it was the allure of being in the tech industry. It was coming out of school with student debt. It was the idea of having full-time employment, even though you had one of the uh, unfashionable degrees in the humanities or social sciences. Uh, it was all of those reasons. It was, uh, it, it, who can blame them um, for wanting a shot at, at, uh, at the tech industry? Um, you know, I, as I mentioned, I myself was a tech worker for many years, and I, and I do put it like that because I, Despite uh, my acumen and despite my early uh, uh, adoption it, relative to others of the internet, I just never seemed to get rich. You know, did any of you, <laughs> anybody else wonder, what am I doing wrong? I'm, I'm in the tech industry in the, in the mid-90s. Why am I not rich and everyone else is? It's almost like it's structural. It's almost like there are barriers up for certain people. I don't know. I should go to grad school and study that. 
Uh, and so that's what I did, actually. Uh, I, you know, I went to school. I started looking at things like, uh, you know, what was the premise and the promise of, of this economy? And where, how do we get here? Um, it, has there been this kind of deliverance that we were sold on largely uh, through the 90s and, and before? Uh, you know, it, is the knowledge society, in other words, all it's cracked up to be? Again, spoiler alert, I'm going to suggest maybe it's not. Uh, we can talk about that. Uh, but what, what do I mean by the knowledge society in the first place? Well, you know, this is kind of a, a catch-all term I'm using to talk about a, a series of aspirational predictions that came about in the 70s, um, uh, particularly those of Daniel Bell, but others, uh, who put forward a, really an aspirational vision of a shift out of what we had known in the United States, which is the context I'm, I'm talking about because that's the one I'm most familiar with, um, in the context of the United States of a manufacturing economy, largely, in the, in the later 20th century. Bell predicted that we'd shift out of that, um, that we would see a, a, a move to kind of a commodity, uh, from a commodity-oriented economy, a manufacturing and, and product uh, creation economy, to one focused on the service sector, one focused on the rise of the technical class, people who engaged in specialized scientific or technical work. Sound familiar? Data analysis, anyone? Engineering, systems management, uh, et cetera. Uh, and that we would see alongside that uh, the increased importance and predominance and prominence of um, technological innovation. Well, I'd say that's pretty spot on. Um, those shifts in concert would result in a service-based, technologically driven economy uh, whose stock and trade would be knowledge work. How many of you consider yourself to be a knowledge worker? Information worker? Yeah, I think we all kind of fall in, I mean, I am, you know? We all fall into that. This would be a desired output, this knowledge, this, this production of knowledge, this stuff of knowledge, and the, and the dealing with it uh, under, the, uh, under this new society arrangement. Uh, in other words, this was about deliverance from the shop floor, and it was a sort of like liberatory new, uh, new way of thinking about work. There were some flaws with this, we'll talk about that. But you know, this is where it was supposed to get us, right? Leisure. You're going to have all type of leisure, right? You're going to, you're going to be in this information sector that is going to be uh, technologically aided such that we can even cut the workday down, right? Well, that's not really what happened. A lot of other stuff was going on in the 70s beyond just this kind of theorizing, including the rise of something called neoliberalism, um, these certain kinds of uh, market-driven ide ideologies that, uh, that put privatization, deregulation, um, uh, fewer worker protections and other kinds of, of things on the map. We also saw, of course, the effects of globalization. So manufacturing certainly didn't cease, did not cease. Maybe it moved from the United States, but manufacturing still goes on, and we know that, and it goes on all over the world. But it's frequently out of sight and out of mind for people in the global north, right? Uh, and a lot of people lost work in the global north, too, because of this change. What's going on today? I don't know, we could call it a lot of things. This is one thing I like to call it, Uberization, gig work, uh, other kinds of phenomena. These are some of these, uh, th these new work forms that have been proposed and that have been actually formulated by a lot of, uh, a lot of the innovations that I think Bell was uh, hoping for, but maybe have come about in different ways. And that instead of raising people up into uh, free time, leisure, economic, um, relative economic comfort. In fact, I would argue we're seeing a push to the bottom, workers being made into precarious contractors, the expansion of the work day, uh, the expansion of work life and, and into privacy so that your car is your workplace, you're checking email all the time, you're always on the clock. Um, companies avoiding taxes, uh, the use of public good for private gain, and other kinds of disruption writ large. I'm really in the belly of the beast to talk about this, you know what I mean? Um, you know, stuff like this, right? Remember this? I told you I'd bring it back. But here's another one. This was Google using uh, uh, the city bus stops in San Francisco to pick up its workers to take them down here to come to work, right? Using that public infrastructure uh, for its own gain. So, in fact, what's happened is these enormal, enormous geospatial, economic, and political reconfigurations that have taken place that have helped not necessarily eliminate labor types, but just hide them, right? Change them, put them in other places, call them by different names, 
um, put them in places like special industrial zones or special economic zones. Those are prevalent uh, in a lot of places in East Asia, but also elsewhere. Um, where terms are favorable for companies, transnational companies, to relocate. And they get sweetheart deals when they do it, and they get uh, promises of things like low labor organi organizing, low labor cost, and other kinds of things when they do that. Um, tax breaks and so on. This is the case, uh, for example, in the Philippines, which just one such place, where there's an entire government in, uh, ministry dedicated to luring transnational companies uh, to, to the Philippines to locate. And this matters in the case of commercial content moderation because the Philippines in the past years, since about 2013, has become the call center capital of the world, surpassing India, surpassing other places that might be in our collective imagination when we think about that work. The, not per capita, just overall surpassed, right? And it's, at, it's a third of the size of India when you think about that. That's actually an enormous uh, economic engine in, in this country. Uh, I went to the Philippines to talk to commercial content moderators there as a part of uh, my research. When I you know, worked with the workers at Megatech, it became clear to me that I had to follow this thread around the globe and know something about what was going on uh, in commercial content moderation context elsewhere because it was intrinsically and intimately tied to the work that was going on here in the United States. These are some slides that I got from uh, the, uh, the Philippine Economic Authority that's in charge of soliciting this work. No graft, no corruption, only three strikes a year. These are the kinds of things that they're selling uh, these transnational corporations, such as social media firms and others, on uh, when, they, when they ask them to relocate or to set up a center there. All right. So, what has happened in a place like Manila? Well, it's not just down to commercial content moderation. This is really a symptom of a larger uh, reorganization. But what we have is incredibly uneven infrastructure and other kinds of development. Uh, some places look like this. This is Bonifacio Glo uh, Global City or BGC. This used to be um, a major military base called Fort McKinley. It's now a, this. <laughs> it's now this urban shopping center. Uh, and then there are other places like this there, right? This is what I call the paperless office. Um, and I'll, I'll say this, you know, I'm from Los Angeles. This kind of gross economic disparity is not endemic solely to places elsewhere in the world. Uh, if you've ever been to downtown LA, you'll see it there, right? So this kind of um, extreme economic uh, disparity and uh, differential development uh, is happening around the globe, and it's a, it's a direct function of these new organizations that I'm talking about. So listen, I'm gonna burn through some of these because we're gonna run out of time. But here's what I found about the case of the Philippines. Um, there was an active, uh, large-scale solicitation of Western social media commercial content moderation. And the firms there were setting up as specialists in this area. So the call centers that existed had the infrastructural and labor ability to provide the social media firms with what they needed to respond to this vast influx of user-generated content. And uh, to my mind, in, in a more disturbing way, uh, the companies were trading on this kind of long-standing you know, colonial dominance of the United States in the case of the Philippines. This particular company, Microsourcing, on its website, told us that Filipinos have excellent language skills, understand Western slang, and have a great eye for detail. Yes, all Filipino people have a great eye for detail, ladies and gentlemen, um, making them perfectly suited for content moderation work. Uh, the, you know, there's a lot of unstated stuff going on behind the scenes there about why uh, people in the Philippines might be intimately familiar with Western slang, for example, more so than others. Uh, this was a company that was also <laughs> offering an unfortunate service called Virtual Captives. And, uh, you know, to their credit, Western firms were coming and signing up for that stuff. So, you know, there, was a, a, there, were, there were buyers for these things. Long story short, what we see in the Philippines, but what we see all over the place, including here, are these intertwined systems that work together to make this new kind of work not only feasible, but sort of an inevitable outcome and a, and a logic that makes sense. Uh, 
I talked to these workers in the Philippines and what I found was that they shared so much in common with the workers at Megatech. Young people, college educated, aspirational, um, urban, sophisticated workers, people who spoke multiple languages, worked in English uh, ev all day, every day uh, in this case, but uh, they work in other languages too. Also interesting, they were, every one of the Filipino workers that I spoke with who was doing content moderation on, uh, for, uh, for call center firms in the Philippines had actually applied to be doing uh, more traditional call center work and be on the phones, but they uh, maybe didn't pass an English language requirement test or some other uh, internal measure which relegated them to content moderation. So commercial content moderation was being seen as sort of the second tier work in the call centers themselves already. Uh, most of these young people, in addition to uh, kind of supporting themselves, were also responsible to a certain extent for some family members. Uh, and they had a lot on their shoulders. Uh, but they were also able to work uh, in Manila, in high-rise buildings, air-conditioned, modern. You know, it was, a, it was a fraught kind of relationship. It wasn't all negative. Um, there were a lot of positives to be working in that environment. They felt, in many cases, like they were working in the tech industry. Maybe the companies that were soliciting the UGC would feel differently about that, but those people had this affective relationship to the companies, right? What was going on for them, however, was an incredible amount of pressure because of the continued global race to the bottom of chasing the lowest bid for commercial content moderation uh, 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 contracts. So the workers that I spoke with when they first started had 32 seconds to decide on a particular piece of content, whether it fell within the parameters of uh, a terms of service or community guidelines of the platform they were uh, moderating for. And by the time I talked to them, it was down to 10 to 15 seconds. Another way to look at that, their production was doubled, right? Or their pay was halved. That's another way to look at that. Why was that the case? Because the contracts were continually being underbid from other places in the world. And the workers themselves felt the pressure of increasing productivity to maintain that contract with their firm and in the Philippines. Uh, but these contracts would up and circulate constantly. All right, you get it, right? What's at stake? Well, we could go all day on this one, and I'm sure you have thoughts too, but I'll just give you a few of mine. Central mission critical activity to social media platforms, but it's little known, often hidden, frequently low, low wage, low status. It is in my opinion, a direct result of new problematic labor forms and new formulations of those relationships. Globalized, outsourced, precarious, people do not have a job that they can count on. Even if they did, can they maintain their sanity doing this work uh, a long term? That's, that's a question. It puts workers in difficult and even dangerous working conditions, often in a psychological sense, right? Uh, it unveils the existence of a legion of human workers behind what, what we often assume to be computational automated processes when we think about them at all. And it troubles the notion of the internet as a seamless space for the free circulation of information and democratic uh, engagement. And that's one that I think we need to think about. So is this a new normal for information intermediaries of all sorts, this kind of behind the scenes hidden work? I ask that of people who do a lot of tech services work, I'm sure. So thinking about being behind the scenes and having your labor hidden or not recognized is probably not that distant to all of you, I would imagine, trying to show your work and show your impact, right? Um, you know, we have also though, a, 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 a de-skilling situation going on here, or a situation where uh, trusted, vetted, trained inform information intermediaries are being swapped out for people um, who are making split-second decontextualized decisions about what can be seen and not seen. Uh, I think that should provoke us and, and make us a bit worried uh, just on its face. We should question aspirational claims that AI is going to ride to the rescue and solve all this. And we should also even ask, what if it could? Why is that, uh, why is that somehow a, an even better situation? Of course, if you care about worker welfare, it would be ideal to get more people out of the front lines of work. But what I've found is that with the introduction of more AI tools, 
what's happening is even more content is being swept in to be vetted and reviewed by human beings rather than it's somehow um, relieving the burden on humans. And uh, you know, it leads us to kind of thoughtless places like this. Uh, you, did you guys see this one? <laughs> you know, it, it, it has this, it has this, it ha somebody's laughing, thank you. It has this, this dangerous uh, uh, eliding of information sources so that we end up with the CEO of, uh, that's who Susan Wojcicki is, CEO of YouTube claiming at South by Southwest last year that YouTube is just like a library. I had somebody say to me after I told them about this, okay, it's, YouTube's like a library, just like an archive is a pile of crap that you throw on the floor unsorted. I mean, he was like, no, you know, I, I was like, okay, I was like, amen, brother, you know what I mean? Um, and it also, it also gets us away from uh, some you know, powerful conversations that I believe that we have in our field and we have overtly and we wrestle with and we argue about and we fight about, which are the politics of what we do. Uh, but this kind of hidden activity of decision making about what can stay and what goes erases the political implications, and I mean that big P, little p, right? of what we see. It gives us a false sense that the environment that we're in informationally online is just because it's the best information or it's what ought to be there or it's what we should see. Um, when we don't understand how the sausage gets made by design, uh, we're gonna have a, a, a very limited view and a very limited mechanism by which we can evaluate our own participation and engagement in these platforms. Um, you know, you see the CEOs of these firms going to other countries and being treated as if they are, uh, as if they are world leaders or heads of state. They have incredible power. Looks like I'm out of time. We're getting some movement over here. So I'm gonna just leave us with, with a few thoughts here. What are social media platforms anyway? This is where I end up with this, right? What, what are these anyway? Uh, well, if you let them do the talking, they'll tell us this. Uh, we are not a media company, stop saying that, look the other way, please don't invoke that. We're tech companies, we're tech companies, we're tech companies. This is not uh, just an existential question, this is really pragmatic. In part, because what happens when you're a broadcasting or a media company in the US? Well, here's just a quick example. You are beholden to all kinds of rules and regulations that tech companies have avoided over the years. And in part, that's helped them flourish but in part that's also helped them develop a legion of commercial content moderators taking stuff down and manipulating information without any account to anyone but the companies themselves. All right, so what's next? Where do we go from here? Yeah, this is how I feel at the end of this, right? This con this, the controversy around how tech companies are doing business isn't going away, but the pressure is largely coming from places outside the US. The European Union is pushing hard on tech companies to be more accountable. The firms don't like that. They're reacting by trying to kind of presage those moves. They're doing things like continually hiring more mod moderators, uh, exponentially so, uh, to meet the demand for things like uh, takedowns that have to come down by law. Um, you know, this was another move over at, over at YouTube to limit their moderators to four hours of content Per day, which I thought, okay, unless you limit that fire hose of UGC of 400 hours per minute per day, what you're going to need to do? Double your workforce, double the exposure of people to this content, not, uh, not really do anything to, to limit the people who are exposed. And again, hiring people left, right, and center. We got some lawsuits. We've got workers who are suing. Microsoft employees have sued two employees and we have a, a content moderator from Facebook who has launched a, uh, uh, a class action suit. Stay tuned to see that. Uh, what am I advocating for today? Well, in part, the whole project of this work has been to render visible the invisible, to get a dialogue going about the hidden work of these workers and the conditions under which they labor, but also for whom they labor and to what end. What are they being asked to moderate and what are the outcomes of the decisions they make? Um, without those kind of conversations, we're gonna have a pretty limited ability to engage and really evaluate these platforms against other institutions that we might wish to shore up. 
uh, and which I think we've been a little negligent of over the past couple decades, right? This is kind of where we are. These are our options, right? Yeah. Or as, as you know, it, it, we have YouTube as our library if we don't con continue to shore these up. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with this. That Forbes article, it got taken down, okay? People complained, probably people in this room complained about it. There was an outcry, it got taken down, uh, and, and they removed it. I'll leave you the, with this one, though. Uh, sort of funny that the story was taken down without comment, as though library folks wouldn't be exactly the people to make sure it remains accessible. And this is what I'm talking about, about the difference between uh, the visibility and invisibility of the decision making and the curation of information. Uh, we need to have a broader dialogue. We need to bring these people out of the shadows and into the light. And we need to put our voice and our expertise back into the conversation where it belongs. And I think I'll leave it right there. Thanks very much. All right, we're, we're a little behind schedule, so we're just going to have a 10-minute break instead of a 15-minute break. Uh, come back at 10.15. I don't have exciting giveaways for you yet. I'm sorry. Um, you'll get to see my charming face again. Um, and also the talks, which are really, you know, why we're here. Um, so 10.15. Thanks, everyone. I'm a librarian in the UC system, so I'm a UC AFT member uh, currently working without a contract. Um, anyway, today I'm going to be talking about programmatic approaches to bias and descriptive metadata. Um, I'm a metadata librarian who works with digital collections, primarily digitized archival collections. Um, maybe we can think of them as the user-generated content of the past. Um, and in this context, um, descriptive metadata tends to be built on repurposed legacy data um, that is tidied up, um, often using tools like OpenRefine or small Python or Bash scripts. Um, those methods can work pretty well for uh, achieving a minimal level of standardization um, and the ability to move data between systems without breaking anything. Um, however, there are often much more complex underlying issues that tend to be addressed inconsistently um, if we address them at all. Namely, the fact that these legacy descriptions carry legacy values about race, gender, and power. Um, terms that might have been normal to use in other times uh, and places no longer match our own values or the values of the people using our collections. Um, sometimes when people call something legacy, they really just mean it happened before I worked here. Um, in this case, I really am talking about a description that can date back to the 19th century or earlier. Um, and has often never really been revisited in a comprehensive way. Um, but from a leadership perspective, um, it has... You can't see your slides. Oh. We're going to fix that. I blame... Uh... Oh, come on. Thanks, Windows, for doing annoying things. Keep changes. Thank you. All right. Uh... Do, do control L for some reason. Hey, there we go. Um, you get an extra 30 seconds. Thank okay. You. Um, well, so this was my previous slide. That was basically what I was just saying. Um, and then this is um, a not uncommon situation for a lot of the data um, about collections that I work with. So like I said, um, you know, sometimes 19th century or earlier, sometimes never really been revisited in a comprehensive way, but from a leadership perspective, it has metadata already, right? So it won't take too much of your time before we can just get it online. Um, even if the language that it contains um, is maybe quaint at best and, um, you know, something that might justifiably get you punched in the face at worst for calling someone that in the present day. Um, and, you know, um, bias in metadata is something that's pretty well discussed in, in terms of kind of a, a prominent library social justice issue. Um, these are just a few projects um, currently that I think are, are interesting. Um, but as much as, as much as I think this issue is fairly well acknowledged in discussion, um, I discovered when I when I started really working a lot with metadata, um, that there really weren't as many tools 
or resources as I had hoped um, for kind of pragmatically and, and programmatically addressing these challenges. Um, and by programmatic, I both mean how can we use code to work with these challenges and how can we make it a regular part of our work, not just a one-off project when there happens to be resources for that particular collection. Um, and I'm speaking within a context of, you know, many of us are working within institutions where there's pressure to digitize bigger collections faster with the same or fewer resources for metadata. Um, improved web discovery of our collections is great, but it also means uh, that offensive or inaccurate description can get disseminated much more widely and much more quickly. Um, and so based on my experience over the past couple of years working with these kinds of collections um, in this context, um, I think that ethically, Publishing our digital collections will take more than what is often the current approach of spot checking and goodwill. Um, so in this vein, uh, I'm gonna be talking about these two small experiments that I have made recently. Um, one is to take a look at Library of Congress subject heading terms for indigenous peoples and reconcile them with Wikidata items um, because Wikidata often has slightly better labels than Library of Congress does. Um, and then also doing some work with natural language processing to identify names of people in metadata where women are just referred to as Mrs. their husband's name and not their own name. Um, so the first project um, or experiment, again, um, you know, there's pretty extensive literature documenting Library of Congress subject heading bias in relation to indigenous people. Um, if you don't know, the kind of primary subject heading um, for indigenous people on this continent is Indians of North America. Um, and the names of specific peoples, um, most of the LC terms end with the word Indians and um, are not even necessarily using the name that, that most people would know. For example, um, this is one of the first ones I came across that got me thinking about this. Um, so I'm from San Diego. Um, I, so where I grew up is Kumeyaay land. Um, that's one of the indigenous cultures that I'm most familiar with. And then I saw in LC, the heading is Kamiya Indians. And that's like, I'd never, I'd never heard anybody say Kamiya. I'd never even seen that before. Um, when I looked into it a little more, it seemed like it was a word that was used for that tribe in one particular anthropological text in the 20s. Um, and so, right, like that's not what our users are gonna search on aside from the fact that it's offensive. Um, and there are, there, there's been a lot of work done around um, alternate thesauri and controlled vocabularies for indigenous contexts. Um, when I started working, um, so one project that I've been working on is with the Sherman Indian Museum, which is a local museum in Riverside of indigenous history. Um, and UC Riverside has, has been working with them to digitize their holdings. Um, and I thought, oh, I, I read about all these cool other controlled vocabularies when I was in library school, like we can use those. Well, usually what I found, things like the National Indian Law Library Thesaurus um, and some others, they are often really designed for a specific project or a use case that they came out of, and they're often not published online. You have to track down, you know, go read the academic paper, track down the person who worked on it, email them, see if they'll send you a Word doc. Um, so, and they're not necessarily designed to be implemented by other organizations. Um, and so as I was doing some of this work, I was finding anecdotally Wikidata seems to have labels that were closer to current usage than the Library of Congress headings. So for example, Wikidata said Kumeyaay people, which was something that made sense to me. Um, you know, of course, bias in, in Wikipedia and in, in Wikimedia communities is, is well documented as well, but I found, um, you know, I think because Wikidata is often pulling from Wikipedia article titles that have been publicly hashed out over time. Um, you know, people have been able to, to discuss them in the open and, and make changes more, um, more fluidly than Library of Congress. Um, then, you know, by and large, they, they made more sense for, for kind of general purpose library work. Um, so what I did, at first I thought, well, maybe I can just write a script that'll go, it'll take the Library of Congress URIs and it'll go out and grab the, the matching Wikidata item. And what I found, so first I, I did some work with the LC Link Data Service to kind of try to get all the, all the names of peoples that I was, so narrower terms of that Indians of North America term. Um, 
narrower terms of complex subjects that had Indians of North America plus a geographic term, um, and using just a regular expression to match ones that had that pattern of blank Indians, ended up with 500 terms. And then when I first ran my Wikidata query, actually only 26 of them had existing matches in Wikidata where the Wikidata item had the LCID. Um, so then it really shifted over to being more of a reconciliation project where I was like, okay, well, how do I match these other ones up? Um, I ended up using OpenRefine for that, um, which if you haven't used it in a while, um, it actually has really good Wikidata integration now. Um, I basically just followed a video tutorial that I linked here. Um, and ultimately, I was able to match 360 of the terms. Um, where I was not able to match them was sometimes I couldn't even tell if the LC term even referred to a group of people that existed, or if it was, again, just something they got from a random anthropology book that you know, maybe, maybe that's not even like a, a real group of people, it was something an anthropologist got wrong and then it got immortalized uh, in LC. Um, I did, I noted uh, several instances of vandalism in Wikidata, um, which was where people had written, you know, either nonsensical or overtly racist things on the, in the labels. Um, so that, a good reminder that if you're working with Wikidata, you're probably not gonna be wanting to pull in labels on the fly. You would wanna be doing some sort of caching and, and verification before making changes or populating anything in a local system. Um, and also just to be mindful that different media um, will manifest racism in different ways. So Wikidata, yes, the labels across the board are better, um, but you might, then you might get some that are really off base because someone came and fucked it up. Um, and, and so when I saw those, I, I changed them. Um, and so now, um, I guess going forward, the idea is that now you can do what I was originally thinking of doing, and if you have a bunch of LC subjects um, in your metadata and you have their URIs, you can, um, you can run a query against Wikidata that'll say, give me the, the Wikidata item that has this, that matches this, this LC item, and you can pull in the label um, if it's more appropriate than the LC label. Um, so the other experiment was I had noticed with a lot of the collections I was working with, um, women would just be identified as Mrs. Husband's first name, last name, so like Mrs. Arnold Jones or Mrs. Joe Garcia. Um, as a metadata librarian, I want to replace that with her own name whenever I'm able to find it. Again, like, it's offensive. It also means that people aren't going to find what they're looking for because if somebody is looking for, um, you know, a particular woman author, for example, they're not going to search for her under Mrs. her husband's name. They're going to search for her name. Um, and so I wanted a mechanism that would be able to identify this pattern across larger data sets so I could flag certain names for review and further research. Um, so I tested on metadata from the Avery Field photos, which is a collection at my institution of early 20th century photos where the metadata had primarily been drawn from the photographer's original labels. Um, and I wrote some code that just generates a CSV report of the names that potentially match this pattern and how frequently they appear in the data. So like now I know, okay, we, we have these names, this comes up 20 times in this collection, I'm gonna try to find out what her name actually is and, and change it. Um, so I used Spacey, uh, the natural language processing library, to identify which parts of the text were names of people that had misses as the preceding word. Um, and then when there was a first name present, I used a Python package called gender guesser to return a guess of the gender associated with the name. Um, there's a lot of different uh, libraries and, and services that kind of purport to do this. Um, I chose one that was a little more uh, naive, I guess, that was primarily based on, on from my understanding, like census and social uh, security type data rather than something that's using machine learning and harvesting from people's social media because I felt like that was a little weird. Um, parsing names and making assumptions about gender are inherently incredibly problematic. Um, so trying to do this work to remediate or, or better understand some of this data sometimes means wading into some, some strange waters where maybe you're using the same tools that people are using to like target advertising to people based on gender based on assumptions of their name. Um, I don't know, I was not comfortable, but I was, I was okay with this in this situation because ultimately the goal is um, to better represent and 
and name women in our metadata. And the assumptions and kind of analysis that we're getting back is just for internal use. Um, so in conclusion, um, I think I see a lot of promise in developing tools for monitoring, assessment, and kind of proactively getting to know our data better. Um, I actually just recently, while I was working on this project, had some super racist photo titles um, that I came across where um, it was actually a legacy collection we've had online for years, and I realized there were several images where they used the N-word in, in naming geographic features. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I'll have to get back to that when I get, I'm gonna take care of that when I get back to work. Um, but you know, that's like, like I said, something that, I, that had been up for years that nobody really was aware of. Um, so I think we really, you know, and I hear from people, especially that work for aggregators, that they do get complaints from users. Um, and again, often nobody on the staff side was aware of these issues before somebody just happens to come across it. Um, I do think, you know, initially when I started this work, I was like, oh, maybe I'll be able to make like an open refine plugin and it can like help make the data less shitty. Um, I think, I mean, maybe that can still happen at some point. Um, I think that at this point, generalizable tools for data remediation are further away, um, but also they're not gonna get here any sooner if we don't kind of wade into the waters. Um, and I would, you know, I think I would encourage other people to explore this area. I mean, part of why I wanted to do this presentation is not to say, hey, I have programmatic approaches to bias and descriptive metadata figured out, but to say, this is, I think this should be a thing, like this is, I want other people to work on this too. Um, don't be dissuaded by the complexity of the issues. I mean, honestly, some of this, um, people who are, Feminists or, or ethnic studies scholars are overqualified to work on this. Some of it is just like, no, you know, we don't say that anymore. And if you're alive right now, you know that. Um, I think writing code can be a form of inquiry that's not inherently solutionist. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about this. Um, thank you. Thank you, Noah. All right, let's see. What's next? My magic sheet of notes will tell me if it's still open. Next up, we have Veronica Ramshaw building a better database list with APIs, which, oh, look at that. It's right there on the desktop, and it's a PowerPoint, so it's going to behave. Um, if, ideally. Ideally, yes. And, hey, look at that. All right, thank you. So, hello, I'm Veronica Ramshaw. I'm the web services librarian at the American University of Sharjah. Um, if you don't know where Sharjah is, you're not alone. Uh, it's in the UAE, so if you know Dubai, really tall building, island shaped like palm trees, we're next door. Um, the institution I work at is AUS, for short. Um, we're an American institution. We have a little over 5,000 students, usually. Um, and we are American accredited and one of the first uh, co-educational institutions in the country. So that's just a little bit of background for you. Um, our library is beautiful, if I do say so myself. I think it's a very lovely place. Um, we have one branch and 10 professional librarians and a whole complement of, uh, of um, paraprofessional staff. Um, and the important thing here, like yes, we have a lot of books, we got a lot of eBooks, but I'm going to be talking about that over 50 online databases. Um, so many years ago, our databases page looked like this. Actually, it was just over a year ago, but it's been a while. <laughs> um, so these, this database A to Z list is pretty straightforward. We've got a page where you can look at it alphabetically by title. We've got a page where you can look at it by subject. Um, the name's there, it links to the database. I'm sure you've all seen pages like this before. Um, but we were going through, we went through a migration. Um, specifically, we were moving from Millennium to uh, WMS uh, from OCLC. And so a lot of things changed around how that list was generated. Um, so we were looking at how we could make it better. Um, our definition of better, uh, we kind of narrowed down to these four things. We wanted it to be relatively automated uh, so that we wouldn't have to do much um, manual changing. 
Um, we wanted it to be clean, uh, no duplicate entries if, uh, if possible, and no complicated or confusing names. To explain that a little bit, for instance, if we have IEEE Explore and IEEE Proceedings, and both of them link to the exact same place, we don't need both of those databases listed. Um, as well, we had some databases that were named like the so-and-so psychology front file international 2007. <laughs> what a mouthful. And our users didn't really know what to make of that. Um, so we wanted it to be more, uh, more clear and understandable to our users. We wanted uh, the, the naming to be consistent across platforms. So whether you were looking in our catalog or on LibGuides or on the library's website, ideally, you would see the same thing called the same way, like business source complete should be business source complete no matter where you're looking at it. Um, there shouldn't be one that still calls it um, business source total or whatever it was called before. Um, and continuity was kind of the cherry on our Sunday for this project. Um, we didn't want to confuse anybody by with our changes, um, but we thought we could like, keep things looking kind of the same, but still have a decent amount of change. So to understand how we uh, chose to do this project, it helps to look at what our system looked like before. So when we had Millennium, this is what it was. Millennium could generate an XML list of our databases, and that was parsed by the two pages on our website to create what I showed you before. Um, then Millennium was also serving the information to our discovery layer, Summon. Um, and Summon had a direct integration with LibGuides uh, where we could actually import from Serial Solutions Summon um, from within LibGuides to keep the databases up to date. However, after our migration, it looked a little more like this. Um, we had WMS WorldCat on its own. Um, disconnected because we hadn't had a chance to connect it to anything yet. We had that databases.xml script. Uh, it had run for the last time, so it was up to date as of the last day uh, we had Millennium. And that was still being parsed by the website. And we had LibGuides floating free on its own. So that gave us these three places we would need to update. First, this is what WorldCat was showing our users. Um, if you look at the collection browse in Journal Finder, you can still see this, um, and it's still less than ideal for us. Um, I'm showing you S right now because you, if you can read that, it's rather small. That's all, all those entries there are different Springer collections. Um, so every collection of Springer eBooks we had purchased was activated as a collection and was displayed as its own thing. Um, Springer recently fixed this, so on this page now we have Springer eBooks and Springer Journals, um, which is exactly the kind of uh, simple, clean, uh, cleaner database list we were hoping for. Um, but for instance, we still have four separate Sage listings and nine Science Direct listings. So that's just in the S's. Um, this web page that I showed you earlier, this is the XML to the side of it. Um, so we were having to edit this manually whenever a change happened, sometimes in multiple places uh, in the document. And we didn't like editing manually in VI because though I'm comfortable with it, um, we did have somebody prior to my time at AUS who accidentally erased pretty much this entire file because he pasted before hitting I to insert. Yeah. So it interpreted every single letter as a different command. Um, so that was kind of a disaster we, we never wanted to repeat. Um, so let's avoid direct editing. And the final place we had to edit manually was the LibGuides A to Z list itself. Um, so this is kind of what I would be looking at when I was going in to change URLs or change database names. Um, if you're familiar at all with LibGuides, the librarians maintain um, different subject, course, or topic um, guides, and it's based a lot on reuse. So they would be reusing these, um, 
these databases across the system. So you can see there's a map count number. Um, again, it might be a little small, but ABI Inform was used in 12 different places, whereas Academic Search Complete had 63. So by updating the database list, we are actually updating every link on the, on the LibGuides, which is part of why this plan came together the way it did. So what was our plan? No longer would we have these three places that needed upgrade, updating. Uh, WMS and WorldCat is uh, sometimes updated by vendors, sometimes updated by fellow librarians at different institutions, and sometimes we're the first ones to get to it, so we do the editing. Um, but on top of that, having the databases XML to change, the lub guides, no more. So we decided we were going to use WorldCat and WMS's APIs to pull the database information out of the system, put it into a format that LibGuides would accept as an import, and then use that as our A to Z list. But how were we going to do this? So we needed to do a bit of setup first. The first thing you can see in the corner, I've highlighted with red, there's an import update databases. That's going to be come in handy later. They have a template, a CSV template. Um, that we used to kind of guide this process. Um, and the other thing I've highlighted in red is the content ID. Um, this, of course, a unique identifier for every database we've already got in LibGuides. So um, that was going to come in handy for matching the databases between um, WMS and our LibGuides. In Collection Manager, our cataloging and metadata librarian, Veronique, added the content IDs from LibGuides in a staff note, and we also uh, eventually started adding uh, subjects as a staff note as well so that we could make this databases page more robust and self-updating. Um, she also changed the collection name if it needed to become clearer, um, added a description text, and we made sure that the um, URL led somewhere that made sense, um, that we really wanted to be the landing page for our users. Um, then it was on to License Manager. So in WMS, um, you have Collection Manager for activating all the collections you're subscribed to, and then you have License Manager for tracking, well, the licenses. Um, so we made sure that there was an active license for every single collection that we uh, wanted to bring over, uh, and we associated the collections with the correct license. And that brings us to the API. We used the, uh, uh, this OCLC API, the World Share License Manager, uh, because it's got a list function which allowed us to really do a harvest of all the licenses, um, and it includes the associated collections in that data. Um, so the script that was written, um, this is just the uh, tip of the iceberg, really. This is the HTML formatted page where we run it um, when we're feeling confident. <laughs> uh, most of the time I run it from the command line to make sure that I can see what's happening. Um, but here, when you hit submit, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, and finally you have a, a libguidesfile.txt. So you really don't see the, the machinations from here. Um, but what's the script doing? So here's the script. It's written in Perl. Um, my boss, Tom, wrote this, and our goal someday is to rewrite it in Python, but for now, it's Perl. Um, the highlights are, this is where it um, parses the license records and identifies the collections that are a part of those licenses, and then it parses further parses the collection records themselves to find all the information required by LibGuide's CSV template. So across the top, there's kind of a comment there that lists the items that are needed, a name, description, URL, collections ID, um, subjects, and a full text indicator. Um, so to kind of summarize this, my colleague Veronique came up with this, uh, this little chart. So, it's checking active licenses and listing them um, using the uh, API's list function and associating the linked collections, then getting the metadata from those collections, including the content ID and subjects from the staff note, and putting it all into a tab-delimited CSV, or .txt file, sorry. Um, 
which has formatting compatible with LibGuides. Then I do a bit of cleanup and load it into LibGuides itself. So I turn that TXT into a CSV by bringing it into Excel, doing some cleanup and getting rid of those collections that don't have collection um, ID numbers. And then the file's ready to be saved as a, uh, a CSV UTF-8. And I go import it into LibGuides, which gives me this screen where I'm able to select which databases I want to update. Maybe I, will, maybe I want to do a full update and get all the newest information in, or perhaps I'm looking to uh, only update a, a couple things and I don't want to risk changing everything at once. Um, so that's up to me and I'm able to process selected and that, well, nothing changes. Oh something changes. It just isn't very in your face about it. Um, it tells you that the data, that database has been updated. Um, so in the end, what are we left with? This is the patron facing A to Z uh, databases page that we created using this process. Um, if your memory is very good, you might remember what the old one looked like, but Assuming the coffee hasn't kicked in yet, old versus new, what's that look like? This is what I showed you earlier, and this is what we have now. So you can see there are more facets at the top there. You can sort by subject and search alphabetically within the same page. It's, uh, it's not um, two pages anymore. And users, if they're so inclined, can even um, limit by vendor or provider. And we've got this popular databases on the side too. Those were, we looked at the usage numbers and looked at which ones actually do get the most hits. So that's, that wasn't determined in any automatic way. That was, uh, that was manual. But did we reach our goal of, of hitting these targets? So automation, we got it. A little bit of human interaction there for the cleanup, but we've got it. Our database list is clean. Um, and it's consistent across the different places, but does it have the continuity? Uh, we're more or less there. We're happy with where we're at continuity-wise. Um, so what lessons did we learn while we were doing this? Um, the script as it currently exists doesn't really have a clean dismount. So when I say you hit the button and nothing happens, nothing happens, the thing that eventually happens is you get an internal server error and that's how you know it's done. Um, <laughs> then you reload the page and hey, that libguides uh, file is, is new and hopefully the right size. Um, it also doesn't have a way to catch and display the errors right now. So if it doesn't complete the run and get to the end of the database list, if I'm not seeing WordPress as the last thing, I'm, um, I know that something went wrong, but I don't know where it went wrong. So it's all a matter of tracking down, like what, what was it? Was it an incorrect character in a subject um, or, or in the description? Was it maybe, um, an active license where the collection had been deselected in collection manager, but was still connected to that license. Like we have to kind of go through the likely suspects and uh, find where that problem might be now. It would be much faster if it would just tell us where that problem was. Um, we also found that we need to run this monthly or bi-monthly to avoid the whiskey expiring and us losing access to the API. Um, in Sharjah, everybody tends to leave over the summer because it gets very, very hot. Um, so there's about a two, three month stretch where there are very few people in the office, um, potentially only one person. So that's a great time for the whiskey to just expire on you and you being left wondering what's happening. Um, and the final lesson was that the popular databases are actually reset every time we update them. Um, so we have to go back in and tell the system again, like, no, please show this as a popular database. Um, so we're still trying to figure out how to, how to work around that one. Um, and that's all I have to say. So if anybody has any questions, I can answer those now. I think I've got about three minutes or so. No questions? Oh, there are some in here. Yeah, I, 
Hello? Hello? Oh, okay. Hi. How much time do you think you're saving by updating it uh, using an automated script as opposed to updating it manually? Um, honestly, right now, since we don't have a way to catch and display the errors, we're not seeing much time saving. But once we have all the kinks ironed out kind of thing, um, it does seem like it will save us. Um, Probably, since I'm updating the, uh, the URLs, usually there's a change, say, once a month um, that needs to be put into place. Um, each one, if I were doing the manual updating, would take me up to an hour to make sure I hit all the spots. Uh, with this script, when it's working as intended, um, it, I, I'm done in 15 minutes. So about 45 minutes a month. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Bueller? Bueller? No? All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. <laughs>
what would typically be called our technical services, so our acquisitions, e-resources, and metadata and cataloging, along with uh, digital library services. So that really helped meant that we could like literally bump into each other at the office water cooler, which was like a super cool, like bubbly water cooler, um, and like bounce ideas off each other. So our colleague Jeremy Prevost, who's somewhere in this room, contacted, oh, there he is, hi, uh, contacted our, my fellow cataloger, Ben Abrahams, and me to see if we could provide advice on working with Mark Metadata and Olive. Um, ben had the great idea to suggest that rather than just provide advice and act as consultants on the project, that we should be proper um, collaborators on the project. And it should be noted that historically, technology projects um, hadn't usually included anybody outside of their directorate. So, um, but Ben and I really believed in the project and we wanted to get like super geeky with metadata and be a part of the process. Um, so the engineers were very res responsive to our requests and they, they had us um, join all of the bi-weekly um, sprint meetings. We joined the Slack channel and the JIRA, of course. Oh, the JIRA. And, um, uh, we were available throughout the whole process to um, like problem solve issues, ask questions, one offs, and like any kind of hiccups that we had. We were really right there for each other. So next we'll talk to um, Helen. We'll talk about steps. Okay, so I'm going to talk through the technical implementation of this project. From the tech side, we had three major goals. Um, they were to design and build the project API first to um, have the data pipeline fully automated and cloud uh, first, and to have a discovery index with stuff in it. So this is the landscape of systems in which we expect the Disco index to fit. We have metadata coming, as Rhonda said, from all these different systems, um, and we focused on indexing data from Olive in the first phase, saving other systems for future phases. We built a pipeline to process the data using cloud services, which I'll talk about in more detail on the next slide. And you can see here that our end product for this project is an API full stop. We did not build a UI to this index. Um, but the API is public and available at timdex.mit.edu. For those of you who don't know, Tim the Beaver is our mascot at MIT. Um, and TIMDEX is a recursive acronym that stands for TIMDEX is making metadata exciting or something like that. Anyway, um, so this API will feed into our Bento search interface, um, but we're thinking of that as a form of user testing and integration, not officially part of this project. Whoa. Um, so here's a detailed diagram of the data pipeline step from the um, the previous overview slide. So this is where we spent the bulk of the work on this project. Um, we have a cron job that exports and does a bit of processing on the data from Olif. That goes directly into an S3 bucket. The S3 bucket event triggers a Lambda, which calls a Fargate task that runs Mario, which is our data processing pipeline. Um, that whole triggering event is uh, Mario power up. So these first three steps are really just about moving the data around so we can parse it for Mark into our index data model. If we have a full Olive dump, it triggers creation of a new index. If it's just a daily update, it uses the existing index. Um, and then finally, if it's a new index, the last step is to promote that to production so there's no downtime during the data processing. Um, where I focused as the data engineer and where we did most of our collaboration with Rhonda's team in metadata, was to develop a standard data model for the index and understand how to parse our MARC records into that standard data model. And the first half of that was just designing it. We needed a data model that would be straightforward and flexible enough to work for other data sources beyond Olive. So thinking ahead about our institutional repository and our archives and special collections, um, it had to easily map to our existing Bento discovery index data model. I mean, sorry, our Bento user interface data model. Um, and because that's our primary initial use case, so we needed to make sure that worked. Um, the important question that came up among the project team in thinking about designing this model was not what fields do users need in the record. We link to the source record in Olive. Users of the API can always get that programmatically if they want to deal with Mark. 
Um, the most important question is what fields do we want to index for searching and then what is the basic information we need to provide so users know what items they've found in the record. So we worked with Rhonda and Ben to identify those fields that were needed for search and discovery and incorporate their deep expertise on that rather than just the software engineers kind of making semi-informed guesses about what would be the most useful fields. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that we decided to write the data pipeline in Go, um, which none of the developers on the project had significant experience with, because why not? Um, and so learning it definitely slowed us down a bit, but we were really happy with it for efficiency. Go is built with concurrency in mind, and we made good use of that. Um, unfortunately, we ran into some existing with the existing uh, issues with the existing Go mark parsing library. So uh, one of our senior software engineers, Mike Graves, ended up writing a new one, which um, because we were dealing with mark, we called FML, which of course, that stands for Fast Mark Library, obviously. <laughs> um, so when it came to the API, this is actually only our second or third public facing API we've built internally. So we don't yet have a lot of API management or documentation tooling. We're kind of new to working with that. Um, so we chose to write the spec using the open API specification and used a tool called Stoplight to automatically generate documentation from that specification. That way we could avoid spending time kind of building out end user documentation and um, information when honestly we're not totally sure yet what users want in that regard. Um, but we are doing user testing. So we worked closely with our user experience team to do some initial testing as we were developing the API spec um, we had some users who had reached out to the libraries to ask about API access to our collections, so we talked to them um, about their needs. We're currently integrating the API with, again, our Bento search interface, um, which we're thinking of as internal user testing, and we're planning to go back and do more testing with those users we've already spoken with now that we have our first release um, and some documentation. Um, one thing I didn't mention before also is that uh, we have recorded all of our architecture decisions about this project in architecture decision records in our GitHub repositories. So any choices we made about the language we use, the tools and systems we used, um, how we built everything, uh, that's all documented right there next to the code, um, including sort of information about other things we might have considered or whether there was full agreement on the engineer team. Um, that we think will help us as we kind of iterate on this project going forward. Um, coming next, our top priorities are integrating metadata from more sources, particularly our DSpace at MIT institutional repository and our archive space metadata, um, finishing up uh, adding this to our Bento search UI. Um, we want to start playing around with tweaking the search algorithms to provide better results. We haven't had an opportunity to do that before. Um, so that will be exciting. Uh, that also means that we want to do some search log analysis so we can even understand what better results really means. Um, so that's a project that we're thinking about working on. Um, and last but not least, we are really excited to have more projects where collaborators uh, from other directorates are officially part of our project teams. Um, that I'll speak for all the engineers and say, it really made a huge difference and was um, wonderful to have them in our daily stand-ups, in our sprint planning meetings, creating tickets on our JIRA board, and fully involved in the planning and implementation of this technology project. Uh, that's it, and I think we have a couple minutes for questions, if anyone has any. Working? Okay, great. I had a question about how many developers were working on the project. You mentioned a development team. Could you tell me how many were working on that? Mm -hmm. So we had um, three engineers uh, officially on the project team, two senior software engineers as the project leads, and then myself as the data engineer. 
Hello? Oh. Um, I'm just curious to, uh, to hear about uh, the uh, learning curve for the Go, um, uh, using Go as your language, how, how that was, uh, because we're, we're actually thinking about starting some projects uh, uh, using Go uh, and just wondering what that was like. Um, it, was, it was a process, <laughs> for sure. Um, I would say we, you know, we knew this project was going to be slower than if we had chosen to write it in Python or Ruby, um, which are the languages we're all much more familiar with. Um, we dedicated time at the beginning of the project to just sort of play around and try things and see what would work best in Go. We definitely made um, some mistakes in how we set up the pipeline initially um, that we were able to kind of iterate on, which was great. Um, I bet Jeremy would have more comments about this, and I'll just say that uh, Jeremy has offered to answer any technical questions about this project for anyone who buys him a beer later, so. <laughs> yeah, um, I have a question over here on the right. Yeah. Um, my experience with extracting data from Mark is that you have to work really, really hard to not end up with a hot mess. I, can you say a few words about that? Uh, <laughs> yes. So um, <laughs> that is also our experience, um, <laughs> indeed. Um, so the library that we were using initially worked fine. Um, it just wasn't fast enough, which is why we wrote um, the one that we're using now. Um, we are still running into errors um, with data coming out of Mark. And that's part of why if we go back to the slide that has the entire list of um, people working on this project. So we have, in addition to the engineers um, and the folks who are experts in Mark, we have a bunch of people from the systems side of the house, our metadata systems librarian, our senior systems librarian, our systems manager. Those are all people who work intimately on a day-to-day -day basis with Olive um, and do a lot of the processing of the Mark records. So they were able to help us figure out when things were going wrong. Was it something we were doing? Was it an issue with Mark? And I'll say that I mean, none of the engineers on the team are Mark experts. So having those folks also working with us really closely made a huge difference. Yeah, um, it, I just wanted to add that it really involved a lot of us um, just like going into a meeting room and, and sitting down and testing stuff and going through and trying to figure out what fields, like, okay, it's coming in really weird, like, are we getting the right things? Like, how can we make it look prettier? But yeah, Mark is a beast. And I'll add that one benefit of having this API now is that um, folks in, the, all of these folks are now um, using it to help identify issues. Um, that they can then use to fix problems in our MARC records, which, shocking, <laughs> exist. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's see where we go. Uh, Gregory Wiedemann. There he is. You've um, got the, the, on the website, right? No. Ah. Function F11. Hey! Hi, everybody. So I'm Greg Wiedemann. I'm the university archivist at UAlbany, and I'm going to talk to you about a project we're working on to make ac uh, provide access to records on American executions. So this is part of the National Death Penalty Archive, which is one of our um, most active collecting areas at UAlbany. And one of the more interesting collections in this area is the Watt Espy papers. And Watt was a bit of an odd guy. He spent decades documenting the death penalty. At his height, he had a network of people all over the country sending him source material, and he created index card summaries of each case, over 24,000 of them, uh, backed by over 100,000 pages of re reference material with both primary and secondary source documents. So this is the most complete record of American executions that we have going back to colonial Jamestown. And these index cards, they're incredibly powerful. They have loads. 
uh, they, they contain stories, and the stories are all really tragic. They contain pe uh, people who have done really horrific things, and also people who have, have had really horrific things done to them. So, and this collection has uh, a bit of a, a history. Um, in the 1980s, there was an S NSF grant to create a data set from this collection, um, and it's now an ICPSR, and it's really commonly used in the social science and criminal justice fields. But we've known for a while that there's some really problems with this data, uh, mostly because researchers spend their money to travel to us and try to look at the source material and view the discrepancies between them. And more recently, there's been some peer-reviewed research that says that we shouldn't assume this data set is wholly authoritative. And this is really important because computational analysis and the death penalty has a really long history. And I'm not gonna go through all, over, um, all of these, but if you don't know what McCluskey v. Kempf is, you should probably look it up. Um, so for this project, we're, we have funding from CLEAR to digitize all the index cards and the source material and provide access not only through the images, but also an API so you can download and iterate through all the data. We're doing this through ArcLight and Hyrax. And I guess the spirit and the mission of this process overall is to, for people who are using this, this collection at scale, we wanted to provide access to the context for all of these cases because many of them have a, really a lot of really important nuance to them. So um, this is not just me working on this project. We have three archivists, um, myself, Mark Wolf, and Melissa McMullen, and a number of graduate student assistants working on the metadata side of things. I mean, we're also really fortunate to have a library system staff in our library, about uh, seven FTE. Um, but this isn't one something that we could have just asked them, hey, can you support ArcLight and Hyrax for us? Because we don't have a long tradition of supporting open source tools at UAlbany. Um, we're a Microsoft campus, and when I started, all of our servers were Windows servers. Uh, and it's not like we didn't have the expertise on campus. What we didn't have is the time, uh, the time to constantly learn new things and find that random error in a listserv, essentially. So, what, but the Clear Grant really demonstrated that with some of this support, we can do some really, really valuable things. So, what we ended up doing is a more collaborative approach with the archivist taking a really hands-on role, particularly with Rails and adapting and configuring more of the more granular systems and doing more of the legwork, while continually relying on our system staff to support the more underlying technologies and for their like, domain expertise throughout the process. This wasn't really a perfect system in many cases. Uh, as you can see, there's no names on the previous slide because all of those positions had some sort of administrative change um, that happened over the course of this project. But, um, and things were delayed, it wasn't perfect, but we came out on the other side with a, a lot more capacity to do these types of projects, both in our library and in our archives, particularly. Um, as you might imagine, we have some sustainability concerns over supporting these tools for the long term, but we just found out in the last couple weeks that uh, the what remaining open position in systems is going to be partially um, dedicated to supporting these, these tools, so which is a major step forward in that. But we're also really, it goes without saying, dependent on the people who maintain and create and devote their time uh, and the wider open source community around these tools. So if you've ever answered our uh, questions on listservs or slacks, thank you very much. We won't be able to do this work without that type of support. So um, how did we do this? The first thing we sort of did to create the metadata was create a Rails application. And normally you wouldn't want to do that for every digitization project, but this was important in this case to give us some time to ramp up and get comfortable with Rails and to find problems and break things and then fix them in a smaller um, environment before diving into configuring something like Hyrax. And the advantage of it was allowed us to quickly make connections between all of these four different source materials we had, and we could make the, com the computer do the really repetitive work, and so we can focus on the really intellectual process of creating uh, all these links. So this is what it looked like, and one of the most like, simple technical things that we did was dump all the data from the original SCP file into Redis, and then we could use this autocomplete to quickly link uh, these pages with that source material. So that worked really well. Um, another thing that was useful, when we were creating these final records, we, since we had control over the interface, we could display all the source material at once and enable people to zoom in and read all of them. So if we have to update or change a lot of the metadata, and we can also document the sources of those changes as well. So that was helpful. Um, but it wasn't perfect. Uh, this was one of our biggest hurdles, and this is a, um, an article from the Chicago Tribune that lists every execution that happened in 1887. 
Um, so we had to make literally hundreds and hundreds of links for all of these pages, and there were many, many of these pages. So this ended up substantially delaying the project more than we expected, um, which is why we're not done at this point. So we also had some other metadata problems. The originally SB file metadata was really bad. As you can see, these are not occupations by any means. So we just got rid of that entire field because it wasn't useful for researchers. It's more indicative of the project than the actual data itself. So even we don't think that it's useful, so we just eliminated that field. Um, we also made some more granular changes, things like changing crime committed to crime convicted of because there's a good possibility that a significant number of these people were innocent of the crimes they were convicted of. But there are some fields we weren't able to be uh, get up to the level uh, that we would like. Uh, the race field in particular, it doesn't confirm to established standards, so we're essentially making sort of random assertions, not random, but problematic assertions about people's race in some cases. Uh, and we, weren't, we couldn't just eliminate that field. We weren't able to get that field and some of the other fields up to the level that uh, we wanted to. So we're very open, much open to learning more about how to do this process better and try to think more about the people that we're uh, documenting. So we're very open for feedback on this process. What I think was even more problematic was the unconfirmed cases, and this is one that really struck with me. This is the card for Phoebe, um, and Phoebe was accused of murdering the person who owned her, and apparently there was a general sense that she was innocent, and when the governor delayed the execution, when that news was delivered to the jail, she made a full confession. So we don't know what happened to Phoebe because the only source material we have are these two um, newspaper articles that, as you can see, are really brief. Um, so these cases, which SB called unconfirmed cases, were not added to the original SB file data set, and we thought that was really problematic. Um, in many cases, there's enough documentation that these executions are were likely to be happen. And we think that even if uh, this execution didn't take place, that this Phoebe's story is part of the story of American executions and this needs to be included in the data set. So we're adding all of these records back into the data set and so far we've added over 6,000 new records. Um, now that number is going to be a lot smaller because we have to really work on disambiguating some of the, um, some of the less documented cases, but we're still looking at multiple thousands of new records added, which I think is a major outcome of the project. And how we're handling this is just adding another field that describes each record as either documented or underdocumented, so you can sort and filter based on those parameters. Um, we had some technical problems to this. Um, since Hyrax uses Fedora, which relies on linked data, it was really hard to find linked data vocabularies to the, for this, with the sufficient precision that we were looking for. Things like, what's the field for crime uh, convicted of instead of crime committed? So we couldn't find um, good URIs for most of the fields. So we thought about creating a new um, vocabulary, but when we start, started thinking about it and talking about it, we decided that we think that this wasn't really useful to encode these cases as linked data URIs. The whole spirit of this project was to provide access to the context of each of these cases and allow for nuance. And by encoding a lot of these problematic cases as URIs, we thought created a false authority or a false objectivity, which we didn't really want to do. So we're just, even though they're still encoded in Fedora with these URIs, we're just providing access primarily through the um, solar index behind Hyrax, which you can't really see those URIs that well, and documenting that as the access point for the, um, for the data, and also uploading just CSVs for people to download. And we're also um, offering this data back to ICPSR that um, has the remaining, the, the existing SB file da data set. So um, we're not quite finished with the, with the project, so we can't really show exactly what this is gonna look like, but we can show our implementation of ArcLight and Hyrax and see where we're going with this. Um, so this is ArcLight, and this is how we're hosting the rest of our collections now. And the cool thing about ArcLight is that when you have minimal metadata, um, it provides access to the, that upper level context, which is really important. So for this, we only have the only metadata we have for this record is David Baldus and a date, but as you can see, there's links on the top that provide access to more context that we can tell that this is correspondence between David Baldus and Hugo Badeau. And ArcLight, since it's like black light, is relying on a solar API that we can provide computational access to this data as well. So you can actually iterate through all of our archival description um, if you'd want, uh, which is really cool. And the other thing is that if we put this object into Hyrax with some simple Java JavaScript, we can query that 
data um, client side and pull in and make those linkages in ArcLight as well. And as you can see, it's cut off a little bit. On the bottom right, you can get a lot of that description from that parent. So we can see like what does individual correspondent mean? Um, and, and the cool thing about this setup is that we can provide access to this for both humans and computers. Now, returning to the records of American executions, we're gonna have a lot more um, detailed metadata about each case um, on the right side, but we also, why this is important is that doesn't tell the whole story for these cases, right? Um, something, we made some, a lot of simple arbitrary decisions over the course of this project, like how to categorize executions that happened in Vermont or West Virginia before those states existed, like what state do they belong in? Um, and generally giving the sense to this, this collection that we think that this data isn't clean if data can ever be clean. So we don't wanna give that false uh, impression that you can just iterate through all this data and ignore a lot of the complexity before that. So we wanna um, provide access to that level of description as well and, that, um, and this is how we're doing that. So we have some code up here. Uh, thank you very much. And if you wanna check out our soft launch of ArcLight and Hyrax, it's out at Albany, archives.albany.edu. Thanks. Oh, yeah, I can take your questions. Anyone have a hand raised next? All right, no questions, I guess. Oh, wait, there's one over here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, so you touch on some of the difficulties of uh, like when you label or kind of present information that it carries the, yeah, a notion of authenticity or truth or something mm -hmm. like that. And I guess that, that seems like a really tricky thing that has just like, it's kind of a broad problem that I think this situation touches on like in a, in, in a big way. And I guess I'm wondering if you could talk about the difficulties of how to provide to a, to a reader, to a user, the, the context required to understand the uncertainty or the, just the, the complexity of a case when they're just looking at text on a screen. Yeah. Um, so I guess to our primary point of access, I think, is the actual um, digitized images, which I think it helps in this case because there's stuff that it's weird about them. They don't look that clean. So in providing access primarily through the API, you can see it in a browser first, hopefully, before you can access it as data. Um, but that's not always going to be the case, right? If someone downloads the CSV file, they don't really get that. So I guess, again, I think a lot of things from archival description can help uh, because we have a lot of um, guidance about providing information about provenance and about where did this data came from. Uh, a lot of these index cards, even like the language they use in them is really problematic in some cases. So um, providing information, like archival description helps us sort of provide the origin of that information. Why is it like that? And how, should, and how does that reflect on how I should use it, I guess. But it's still a very problem, uh, large problem to solve. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. You have time. This is, a, this is a loaded question, Greg, but what's ArcLight? <laughs> ArcLight is a system to, uh, a Rails system. It's basically a customized version of Blacklight to provide access to archival description, whether it's, it indexes EAD into a Blacklight-like interface that's easily customizable and provides computational access to your description as well as uh, human access through a browser. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let's see. Who do we have next? That was number four. Next up is uh, Dominique Luster. Is that right? Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Machine learning and metadata with the Charles T. Harris archive. Nice. I sense a theme. Ah, nice. Good morning. I'm a very lively person, so good morning. All right. Um, so my name is Dominique Luster. I'm super excited to talk to you for 15 minutes as we start um, about the Charles Teeny Harris collection. We are a collection at the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, come visit us. It's a single artist collection. 
Uh, the artist is Charles Steeny Harris, as you'll see on the screen, 1908 to 1998. Uh, it is also a very medium-specific collection. Um, so it is predominantly all photography. There is very little manuscript material. Um, as you can see, it is a traditional large format uh, photography collection. It's four by five, all, well, majority all acetate-based negatives. There's a few nitrates mixed in here and there, but it's predominantly uh, large format press photography. There's also a small amount of color materials, some prints, uh, some manuscript material, as I mentioned earlier, and then out over the years, since 2001, since the collection was acquired into the museum, we have added a supplemental collection of oral histories. So it is the collection of an African-American community, predominantly African-American community in Pittsburgh. Charles Steeny Harris, as you saw on this slide before, was an African-American press photographer, worked for the Pittsburgh Courier. Um, so this collection is going to document the everyday lives of, of, of African-Americans really in America, not just in Pittsburgh. So what I'm going to be talking about is a very specific project um, that started in a, well, the original project started uh, in about 2007. 2005 maybe, thanks to the very generous support of NEH. Um, they provided consistent funding for us to start digitizing the entire collection. So for the archivists in the room, hold your breath. Yes, we did digitize an item level catalog with a catalog record for 80,000 records. Yeah, they did, not I, they did. Because uh, I'm not choosing to do that, um, but, but, it has created a wealth of information and of item-specific information regarding this collection that we can now use as amenable to computation later. Um, so the fact that they did this work over probably about eight years um, is really, really valuable to us. So let's just kind of like set the stage here for what I'm gonna talk about. I'm sure you can see where this is going, but over the course of about eight to 10 years, there were maybe eight to 10 different archivists, uh, probably 25 to 50 different interns, student workers, GAs, paraprofessionals coming in and out of the archive, all item level cataloging over the course of about eight to 10 years. So <laughs> Dominique now has a problem. Um, I have a very, very large, unruly collection that is very important to the history of America, but is nothing but uh, inconsistent data um, that is very difficult to clean. Um, so I thought I would give you some examples of what happened. And uh, this is going to be fun. This is participatory, so hang on. So this is a photo from the collection, and what you see here is the title. So, group portrait of two men, including one on right, wearing a dark hat, eyeglasses, colored shirt, dark pinstripe suit, poised on right hand in pocket, standing on sidewalk with woman holding baby on left, other people, trees, and telephone poles. <laughs> you thought I was joking. Here we go. Portrait of man wearing dark jacket with light colored handkerchief in breast pocket, mustache, eyeglasses, pattern tie, holding cigarette, and seated at desk with newspaper, with headlines saying, quote, answers mob with guns, tear gas, and op, uh, you know. Okay, so you get the point. These are the titles. The descriptions are worse. <laughs> but they're all not that bad. I searched for this group. I searched the entire collection to find one that wasn't bad. Here you go. This is my gift to you. Young man wearing light colored short and Center Avenue wide t -shirt. You can read. You can read. Um, this is not that bad. The rest is worse. So you start to think about like, who did this? Why did you do this? What compelled you to possibly do this? And then, because I'm so smart, I took the job saying that I would clean it, right? <laughs> Great. Um, so here we are, and we're looking at all of these titles, and it also trickles down into the subject headings, into the description, into pretty much every pervasive metadata element of the entire collection of all 80,000 records looks like this completely uncontrolled, completely like just sprawling out of hand. Um, so, when we say 
When my bosses are like, I don't see the problem, what's wrong? I'm like, here, let me form a beautiful slide that tells you the problem. So one, as a trained archivist, we are very far from best practices of derived titles. Uh, just in general, uh, what we think about and how we would like to have uh, language and control over titles and over metadata elements, we are way far outside of best practices in the archival field. And we're also way far outside of best practices within the museum field. As I mentioned, my, collection, my archival collection exists within the Carnegie Museum of Art, so we're consistently fighting with both at the same time. Um, we're also, as you could see, dealing with inconsistent structures of language. So sometimes every single human in a photo of 30 people will be titled out by name in the title, top to bottom, left to right. Sometimes in a photo of 30 people, no one will be listed. Sometimes, like, it's just inconsistent structures of verbs, of tense, of nouns, of prepositional phrases. Everything about it is inconsistent. It also, because it's so wild, it does not connect well with other collections. So there are plenty of really inspirational and amazing African American or just photography collections all over the country at I'm sure many of your universities that we would love to be sharing and linking with and collaborating with. Y'all don't want to collaborate with me? Because when I start sending you my JSON files, they look like that. Like, you don't want to talk to me. <laughs> like, I assure you, I've probably emailed to some of y'all and y'all have been like, mm, hi, bye. So, but it's okay, we're all friends now, it's fine. Um, also, I didn't mention that uh, almost everything that you saw is free text. It's not um, connected or uh, to any authorized body of any kind, they just made it up. Um, including all the subject headings, are, as I'll show you in a, in a later slide, are all free text, made up, um, not really connected to anything. And also, for me, one of the biggest problems at hand is the cultural constructs of the collection are completely um, silenced and disabandoned. So one of the reasons originally why they developed this best practice to describe the collection the way they did was to, in the efforts of not trying to be racist. Um, but when you silence people of color by describing their ties and mustaches and eyeglasses, you get the point. It's, you can't do that. Um, you can't silence or oppress people from their content in order to avoid. You have to really do the work of cultural competency to really understand how you can approach these things with assurity and, and with dignity and respect. Um, so these are the problems. How do we solve these problems? I didn't know, so I found smarter people who did. These are my friends, or at least I ask them very kindly to be my friends. Um, so. Samantha, we have a couple of um, creative technologists on our staff. Um, as you see here, some web developers, some admin uh, systems uh, managers. We also partnered with Carney. Um, a couple of folks out of Carney decided to take pity on us and come in and help me. Um, I also cried just a little bit, and, and then they caved. Um, so I had this brilliant idea, sort of, that maybe we could do one week and fix it. Well, not really. We could do one week and see if it's fixable. So that was the plan. Um, I kind of took this idea to my bosses and said, hi, I have a problem. I'm not sure how to solve it. I'm not actually even sure if it's solvable because of the extent of the damage. But I would like the opportunity and some money to take one week and see if this problem even is solvable. So that's what we did. And these were our uh, goals for the week. Well, we all kind of just got into a room similar to this and kind of just hive brained uh, for the week. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of our results, um, if you will. So the first project that we took on was the subject headings problem. In the far, what is that? Your right, I don't know, your left, whatever. The one that says existing subject header, you will see how free texted the subject headings were listed into the collections database. We use EMU, uh, KE EMU, it's an Axial product. Um, and you'll see that the archivists and technicians over time would say things like boys, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, baseball, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. The one that I covered uh, was one where the subject heading suggestion was inappropriate and racist um, as provided by Library of Congress. So what we did was we took the existing subject headers and we um, swapped in, we used, uh, we used some work to kind of swap in to create 
uh, a program that would suggest subject headings uh, for us. And then the archivist, as a personal quality control myself, would go through and be able to say approve, 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 decline, approve, decline, approve. Um, so that's how we did this. Um, and the, like I said, the one that I marked out is because the Library of Congress gave us back something that was culturally inappropriate. Um, and here's another one. Here's another example where the existing subject headings you see on the far end and in the middle, you'll see what our uh, program kind of spit out as suggested. Uh, we also took on the concept of shortening titles. Um, as you can see, as I mentioned, these are the real titles of the object. And it would include names, people standing on left or right, kneeling, whatever. And so we used uh, two programs to try and pare that down, Textacy and Spacey, um, to kind of par pare that down to the after that you see there. Here's another example of us trying to shorten titles. We also played around with some natural entity recognition to see if we could just extract names out of it because it was so out of control. We were like, if we could just get a handle on the names, maybe we could just start there. Um, so we actually did a natural entity uh, toolkit and we tried the um, Stanford library. And the Stanford one actually works a lot better. Um, and that's where these extracted names came in. Any confusions that came from mostly when the computer couldn't tell a name from like the name of like a gas station or something like that. So the last part that we tried uh, was some dabbling into facial recognition. Um, of the 80,000 objects, the tools, the best tool that we got uh, came up with 3,200 actual matches. And some are very obvious, like these, so different poses of the same image. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we came into one, the issue of that they're mid-century black and white photographs, so they're physical that was digitized, so problem A, they're black and white, problem B, and they're of African Americans, problem C, D, E, F, and G, right? So um, we had a couple of really obvious matches. We had very few holy grails. Um, it worked at about 5%. Uh, holy grails here in different locations, different clothing. Here's another example of a holy grail that we found. And um, as I mentioned, the difficulty of working with these kinds of materials is that you get, the computer just can't recognize uh, a lot of uh, African American faces. So it makes it very, very wrong. So what's the point, Dominique? Why are you telling us such a sad story? Um, so the point is that we are really excited to be a part of the new collections as data part to whole. I don't know if Thomas is actually in the room. I heard he was here. Hey, uh, so shout out to all of the great, amazing folks on the Collections to Data team who have given us the amazing opportunity to take this research that we did in one week and prove that it actually could work. So right now we're developing this out to everything that it could and will be um, and a tool that really, really will work. We're proof, like it's almost, the tool is actually almost done, Thomas. It's only February and we're actually almost done. Um, but we're really, really excited for the opportunity to take something that we weren't even sure could work and turn it into an opportunity with the support of a lot of really amazing people to develop a tool um, that can actually change uh, the way this works. So if you have any questions, advice, suggestions, feelings, uh, please feel free to reach out to me um, at the Carnegie Museum of Art. There's both my email and my uh, Twitter. Um, I'm happy, if I don't know the answer, the developers on my team do. I'm the archivist, so thank you so much for letting me speak today. Thank you. One question. Uh, so just a question, have you kept around the other, like the longer titles as well on the website since they do contain information that could okay. be used? Are you keeping the longer titles? To, yeah, are you interested in learning how you can maybe connect that to make the site uh, more accessible to the blind and low vision? Yes. We should talk. Love. Done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, up next, I th oh, here we go, uh, uh, Pooja Koirala. 
Yep. Scholarship recipient, by the way. Come on, he's, he's thank you. All right, enriching library collection analysis using Python. Good morning, everybody. I am Pujit Koirala, representing Minnesota State University. I am doing my master's in the university, and I also do a GA in the library, and that's how I got introduced to the code for leaf, working in the library. And then I'm going to give a small my presentation. Uh, it's enriched library collection analysis using Python. So today my presentation, I will be just uh, taking you through the what, why, and how I have done one of the, this is just a prototype version. I have not been completely done it and showing my things that I have been doing. So to start with, I start with what, and explain a little bit about the context that as a GA, I joined a team working on a journal collection analysis database called JCADB. This database produces a report to support collection management, uh, collection development, and collection outreach, including accreditation reviews. So the base data produced for this report includes 100 plus data elements from numerous underlying data sources such as user statistics, holding information, evaluation criteria such as SIMOGL, site score, etc. The base data is used to produce data visualization using Excel, Tableau, which in turn is used for decision making. So this is one of the visualization that has been generated using Excel from the same base data called JCADV. At the present, the base data has some has no any info about the faculty publications and citations. So my like the goal was to develop some tools to work to find the citation analysis for the public faculty member of the university. That's how I started this. That's how the project was started. So this is the like why we have started the project. As I mentioned, we don't have any, we have a lot of information in our base data, but we don't have the publications and citation info. So that's the main reason we started this project. Uh, so we want to get some statistics about the faculty and about the faculty members about publications and citations they have done. So other libraries do this tax in the manual way, which is a tedious. And then our goal was to do some automation so that we can have some easy way to do this. So the data source that I used to work in this project was an open source data set called from Crossref, which is an open source founded in 2000. And this is one of the digital object identifier recognition, which has a cross API for multiple publishers. So we can use URL to query the data based on the, our requirements, like based on author, based on DOI, or based on publications. Based, so yeah, the metadata we can achieve from this cross-ref are like title, references, author, ISSN, funding information, license, published data, there are other more metadata. So we can query the cross-ref metadata based on a multiple parameters like author, DOI, title, here are some of the examples. So I am just using the Crossref API to find the agency for the given DOI, and I'm getting the agency as a Crossref. So this is one of the query we use to get the publications for based on the author name, like I am using here just for a Daniel Holian, and it sorts the number of rows that we have provided, I mean the number of publications it has in the Crossref database. So this is one of the another query for the given uh, DOI, for the given DOI. We get some of the metadata based on this. So these are a couple of informations we can extract using the URLs. So now the next task is how I developed my, I'll be explaining how I developed my prototype and work to the problem. So the first step was to use the, I just use the author query to fetch data from the Crossref URL, Crossref database, 
and uh, the author can be given as a single author or a multiple author. So I just created a small file where I wrote all the name of the authors and then my script would run that file, grab the author name and then automatically generates all the JSON files. So the result for that will be this kind of information. So based on this, meta, as I have mentioned some of the metadata I, we do get from the Crossref. So I just extracted those metadata. So the results are in the JSON format. So just I use a key pair value and extracted all those required metadata. Still here, we I face some of the challenges like the name being like the name are not in a given like first name and last name. The, some of the authors will have first name and last name, and some authors will have last name and first name. The same author can have. I mean, different authors can have the same name. So these are the couple of challenges I had found and I had a special case handling for individual those kind of environments. So this is a basic uh, output I get when I just give a few, uh, give, give a particular author name and I'll get this. So I have to start like, uh, I have to start write a script to handle this, uh, this file and get the required metadata. In that case, this is how I like, I got some of the inconsistent about different names, missing of the metadata key. Also the one of the problem was for all the public, for all the authors, like the metadata, I didn't get the consistent metadata. There might be few metadata in one of the publications, but that metadata is not present in others. So here also I have to write a special case handling to fetch only the required metadata, and if it is not present, just give some random value. And then later on, we can filter out that this is not there. So this is one of the script that I have written to handle the uh, filtering is, uh, of the data, like if we have ISSN present in the given, I'll just take that ISSN, otherwise I'll just put a blank value, and then later on, in during the post validation, we can handle this kind of information. So this is how I worked. And the next step is to, uh, as our JCADB was, I just mentioned earlier, JCADB is a base repository. It was in the MySQL database, so to integrate with the existing database, I just dump everything in the MySQL environment database, and so that we can have like some more aggregated information for the whole or for the whole base JCADB. So this is how I use the script to create tables and then write the information in the MySQL database. So this is the inserting script, and this is one of the results that I have generated based on the scripts that I wrote. So here what I'm showing is for uh, when I run the author query, uh, I am pulling all the information for the author named Daniel Holwyn and his all the publications. We have a DOI and this is the number of times that individual title has been referenced by some other publications. So this is how I am generating the uh, information and the next task is to get in, the integrate this in the existing JCADB. So this is how I am going to enrich our existing JCADB with the data fetching from Crossref API. Thank you. That is all. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. Okay. Up next is, I believe, our last talk of the block, which is Scott W. H. Young, Jason A. Clark of Ethics User, Users and Data, building a national conversation for web privacy and web analytics. And are you guys going to use presenter mode or just the slides? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so we're excited to be here. CodeFlip is so awesome. Um, such a great morning so far. I'm Scott Young, user experience and assessment librarian at Montana State University. And this is 
Jason Clark, also at MSU. And we're here presenting alongside our um, co pair on this project, Sarah Mannheimer, data librarian at Montana State. Sarah's right up here in the front. Um, so our talk today is Of Ethics, Users, and Data, Building a National Conversation for Web Privacy um, and Web Analytics. Uh, we want to start with some acknowledgments. Uh, we just want to express our gratitude to the Ohlone people, um, the ancestral stewards of the San Jose Territory. Um, we also want to recognize that the state of California, the land now known as California, um, is the home to over 100 different and unique um, Native communities. And uh, we want to recognize that when we say this, um, acknowledgments like this are, are empty unless they are connected to action in solidarity with Native people. Um, so we've tried to be conscious of that in this project, and we'll talk about that a little bit more um, as we go on. So the outline today, um, we'll talk about our, what our project is, like just what we're doing, um, the creative process that we took to get here, um, and then what we've produced together um, with the community, and, uh, and then where we're headed, where we're going. And I just want to say that um, I tweeted out the slides to the hashtag. So if you want to follow along, um, that should be there now. OK, so what is this project? Um, the title of it is A National Forum on Web Privacy and Web Analytics. It's funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, supported by our institution, Montana State University. Uh, we're extremely thankful to the IMLS for existing um, and all the people that work there and all the reviewers um, that review the projects. Um, IMLS is just a great institution. Um, so me, Sarah, Jason, Lisa Hinchliff um, is a project analyst on the team. Uh, Jacqueline Frank and David Swedman are support personnel at our library. Um, project couldn't have been possible um, without these people. And here we are. This is an MSU news item, just a little hype for our project we wanted to share with you. Um, yeah. Here's our project URL. This is probably the most important thing we have to share today, actually. lib.montana.edu slash privacy dash forum. I'll just leave this up here for a second. Um, I guess you could also say lib.montana.edu privacy forum. Um, but this has all the information about our project. Um, so we'll come back to this URL and talk more about what's there. But this is like the, the home base for us. So check it out. What we're trying to accomplish, we want to critically address web analytics practices in libraries. Um, and we want to try to develop a roadmap towards um, a better, more privacy-aware, values-driven analytics practice in our profession. So this is what we're trying to do. And how we responded to those, those goals, um, the IMLS grant that we got is called the National Forum Grant. Um, it exists to support travel for people to come together into a room for two or three days and to try to solve a problem, um, or at least to I identify new ideas for addressing a problem. So we invited about 40 people to Bozeman, Montana, um, which is a beautiful place where our campus is. Um, here are the participants. Um, this text is very small, um, but we had to do that to get all the participants on here. Uh, the participants were awesome. Some of the participants are in the room today. Uh, we just want to say thank you again. Um, the ideas that were produced in our project were the result of all of these people. Um, so just thank you again to everyone. We started by uh, sending all the participants a preformed survey that asked some questions about privacy and analytics. And the major themes that emerged, which formed the sort of structure of our project, um, the participants were concerned with privacy policies and privacy statements, practical guidelines for implementing analytics, uh, finding partnerships and collaborations, um, working towards equity and justice, um, connecting those ideas with privacy and our analytics practices, developing new outreach and education models for different communities, um, and then exploring different analytics tools. Um, Google Analytics is obviously a leading one, but what else is out there? What else is out there? So, so then we had this forum event. Um, we had all these people come to Montana. It was awesome. Uh, we followed a participatory design co-creative process using tools based on um, these resources here. Gamestorming is an awesome book. Um, and then there's this uh, tool set, 75 Tools for Creative Thinking. Um, these, are, these are great tools, um, so check them out. Um, it's basically structured dialogue, creative thinking, um, and idea generation tools. So uh, to illustrate some of what we did, um, we played a game 
a number of games. This one's called Float Your Boat. Um, and so we asked participants to split up into small groups and to draw a boat. The boat represents, in this case, uh, privacy, education, and engagement. So a lot of these exercises use metaphor to structure our thinking. So uh, the metaphor here is sails and anchors. So the anchors represent obstacles and challenges to um, privacy, education, and engagement. The sails represent our strengths as libraries. Uh, and so this group drew some, some user challenges, such as sometimes users are a little disengaged. Uh, they prioritize convenience and time over privacy. Sometimes they have low literacy around technology um, and maybe an over-reliance on, um, on some tools um, and an under-reliance on other tools. Of course, our library administration, sometimes they focus on cost over other benefits. Um, there's a lack of stakeholder knowledge from administration sometimes and then competing priorities. Hmm. So these kinds of exercises give us um, something to respond to, um, give, us, give us notes that we can use. The sales, of course, we've got lots of strengths in libraries. We have an awareness of privacy. Um, there is some um, additional momentum and money for collective action. Um, we want to center our users, um, and we have an incredible physical presence on a lot of our campuses um, and our communities. And from there, libraries are trusted sources. How can we leverage that trust for better analytics practice? Um, and then using some of our existing statements, like the ALA Code of Ethics, ACM Code of Ethics, and many others that try to um, point a way forward. So this float your boat exercise was kind of like exploring the topic area of privacy. And then we turned to more um, exercises that structured towards some uh, concrete ideas for what to do. So this is a screenshot um, or a, a photo from, from our working space of an exercise that we called Moscow. So we asked participants to um, imagine a new product or a new service that could enhance privacy. And then in that product or service, what were some aspects that they must have, it should have, shouldn't have, could have, would like to have, but won't get. So all sorts of ideas came forward for what are some effective, practical ways to, to address this, this challenge of privacy and analytics um, in libraries. And so we synthesized all the data that came forward last fall and, and we're ready to share, share with the community um, the, the ideas that came forward. So I'm gonna talk a bit more about the project outcomes. I just realized I match my um, water bottle. Um, <laughs> librarian gonna library, I guess. If I'm nothing if not I'm on point. Um, and one of the things I want to stress, as you saw uh, Scott talking through the process and some of the facilitation we did during the event, um, this is a messy, creative, and beautiful process. Um, and it's never, a, it wasn't a straight line. Um, we, there were 10 parts of the conversation that went to areas like, well, we'll just not collect any data that solves our problem. No data, no problem. Um, and then you had other parts of the room which were speaking to, well, maybe learning analytics isn't that bad. Maybe we can learn from it. Um, so it was a wide-ranging discussion. Um, and what I'm going to talk to is the different actions um, that are potentially part of this. Uh, I do want to stress that any of these outcomes probably require community investment, which is why we're here, potentially institutional investment, and uh, third, uh, maybe even additional grant kind of investment to make uh, these ideas really move forward. Um, and so what we're presenting to you, I'm gonna go pretty fast because I wanna stay on, on task. Um, we're just looking for a, a, a particular, any kind of engagement, participation, um, in, and, and or new ideas that really bring these pathways to action. Uh, I'm not gonna read everything because I will go through um, each one in a little more detail. But just to, we settled on eight primary kinds of themes um, and pathways. Um, the first was an idea around a certification system um, for identifying how, uh, how you can collect analytics with, uh, and, and reach a certain level of certification around privacy, much like um, maybe for this group, if you think of five-star linked data, you know, gradations of, of certification and or, uh, in this case, leads certification, environmental standards. Um, there, there are ways to think through this, so that was kind of one of the 
primary ideas. Another one that came up, there were, um, there were sort of social working groups, ethical working groups, technical working groups. From the technical working group, there was an idea of a, an analytics dashboard. Um, I know that a, a, a lot of us are aware of different kinds of analytics that are out there, like Matomo and Countly and Simple Analytics, but uh, one that is framed in very lightweight uh, that would work for, to answer most of our analytics questions is something I think this, this group in particular is really well suited to. Um, <clears throat> This, uh, one of the things that we recognized, you, know, uh, you, you didn't really see, get a chance to really parse that participant list, but we didn't have a lot of administrators in the room. Um, and so one of the ideas was to connect these conversations to leadership training and um, making sure that there were modules or learning, and learning uh, tools for those types of environments. So if you think of like the Harvard Library Leadership Institute or Leading Change, having a, mo a, a chance to um, introduce leadership training and talking points into those environments we think is really essential. Did I go too fast? Um, we also have a, a network uh, at MSU called the Tribal College Librarians Institute and we had tribal college uh, members and representatives that were part of the conversation. Um, so we asked, uh, there was some interest in finding out how marginalized communities are impacted by privacy and in particular tribal college universities, so if that's something that interests you, please uh, keep that in mind and reach out. Um, the model license is probably one of the outcomes that has the most momentum right now. Lisa Hinchcliffe is, has been uh, presented at CNI on this idea, um, really working with how to put patron privacy language in front of vendors and library systems to introduce new kinds of license and ways that they can um, answer our needs and uh, respect privacy itself. And then uh, we also recognize that there is, um, we need researchers around this idea. So the idea of some kind of fellowship or research institute, which is really focused on, much like what we saw with Sarah's talk this morning, that really takes a deep dive into privacy and what is necessary, um, and then explicating that and, and, and going out and, and making sure to present that research. Um, that's another potential pathway. Other parts focused on, uh, on um, I just checked the time, sorry, uh, on professional development for librarians um, and how we might uh, help them come to terms and learn more about how to do privacy. Uh, again, assessment, the, the toolkit itself would also be a, a working item for uh, professional development of librarians. Um, the other outcome was uh, an action handbook, and really we, we worked through, we finished this week, um, so it's a draft, and it is linked on the, on the website itself. Um, these are just practical recommendations for implementing different kinds of analytics practices, and uh, we, we did recognize that this is a technical and a social, there, there's a cultural component to this, there's an education, and um, so both of those are parts of pathway or suggested ways to engage in privacy in your organization. And I'm gonna hand it back to Scott. Okay, so where do we go from here? Um, <clears throat> our project team wants to facilitate the realization of, of one or more of these pathways that Jason just, um, just overviewed. And we recognize that this is a huge, a huge undertaking. Um, there's large cultural questions that we're asking, um, potentially new practices and tools that we're suggesting that we build together. Um, so th this is a community, community effort um, to achieve a community goal of, uh, of realizing our, our privacy values in our analytics practices. Um, so we've got a lot of background from the privacy forum, lots of notes and ideas for how these ideas could actually um, come into reality, um, but we need a little bit more help to do that. Um, so we're asking you to visit our project website. Um, lib.montana.edu slash privacy dash forum. Um, take a look at the pathways. Um, we have one page summaries of each of the pathways linked from this URL, as well as our action handbook. Um, please leave comments, uh, leave feedback, um, ideas for improvements. Network out from here, share with your departments and your institutions back home. Um, let them know that these ideas um, exist, that they're on the table ready to be picked up. Um, 
here is a screenshot of our homepage. This is what you'll get if you go to lib.montana.edu slash privacy dash forum. Um, and here's a screenshot of our, um, our pathways. So click into those, take a look, let us know how they could be improved, um, how we can turn them into a reality. And then if you're inspired to contribute in any way to any of these potential pathways, um, if you find yourself inspired, uh, here they are again. These are our eight main ideas. Contact us. Uh, I'm Scott. Sarah's here. Jason's here. We want to talk about privacy. Um, so thanks. Okay, pre-lunch announcements. If you are giving a talk this afternoon, please come up to the podium during lunch um, and load your talk. Make sure the setup's uh, set up the way you like it. If you've got weirdness with Google Slides and you want presenter mode to work, I can show you the tricks. Um, uh, if there's also, if you have not yet taken advantage of it, there are breakout signups and lighting talk signups. Does anyone know if there are slots left on those at this moment? There may or may not be. Um, find out. Um, and we are, I don't know how it happened, we are, we are three minutes early. So lunch starts in three minutes and you should be back here at 1.20 and no later. Otherwise, uh, Whitney, who's our afternoon MC, will give you dirty looks. All right, thank you. Enjoy lunch.